Coming up on this episode of DL Weekly, new Disneyland After Dark details, a change in pre-sale event tickets, some cast members might be joining a union, the food and wine foodie guide dropped, we talked to Alex about his time as a big Thunder cast member, and more. DL Weekly starts now. Howdy, partners! For your safety, remain seated with your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the podcast, and be sure to watch your ears. If any of you folks are wearing hats or glasses, best remove them, because Tag and Teresa have the wildest ride in the wilderness. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of DL Weekly for the week of February 21st, 2024. I'm Tag Bushman. And I'm Teresa Urban. We would like to thank everyone who supports the show. This week, we would like to give a special shout out to Heather G and Christy S for both becoming official weekly tiers. A special thank you also to Brandon S and Mark T for your continued support. If you would like to help support the show to make sure that we can keep bringing you the latest news and information, discussion, and interviews about Disneyland, head on over to dealweekly.net slash support. Now let's get to the news. Well, new details have been released for the next Disneyland After Dark event. Star Wars Nights tickets went on sale for Inspire-level Magic Key holders on Tuesday, February 20th, with other Magic Key holder pre-sales happening on Wednesday and Thursday, the 21st and 22nd. That is the day this podcast drops and the day after. The general public can get tickets starting Friday, February 23rd, no earlier than 9 a.m. Disneyland time. There will be a new notify me option for the virtual queue that will email you when your window to order has arrived. You have 10 minutes to visit the site and purchase tickets after you get the email. I'm really interested in how they're doing the change up on this. I'm hoping this will help relieve some frustrations. And I also think that it's kind of cool that being a top tier key holder gets you like even earlier access than just being a key holder. I think that was a really cool move on Disney's part. I did see some comments on the Disney Parks blog. I do think there may have been a missed opportunity. A lot of people were like, hey, what if you're a DVC member? Oh. So I think that that maybe have was a group that was overlooked that probably shouldn't have been. But I do think it's interesting that it's almost like we were talking about this because you're going on a Disney cruise later this year. We were talking about how the wind, it's kind of like a graduated window opening system for, you know, if you've cruised your first time versus your 100th time, the more dedicated you are, I guess. Loyal of a customer. There you go. The more loyal of a customer you are, then, you know, there's, there's kind of perks to that. So that's kind of what this feels like is, you know, you're kind of a, a more, I don't know, loyal if you're someone like a key holder or a DVC member or whatever. And well, so it's it's interesting that they've got it. They're making that expensive top tier pass even more valuable. Well, that's good because we've always talked about how the annual passes or magic keys oh, yeah, in magic this case, keys, sorry. you know, are things that, that there needs to be more value brought to them because the prices mm-hmm. keep going up. This is something that there actually is a value to that yeah. literally costs Disney nothing. Well, and just think these people don't have to have that headache because there's going to be yes. far less of the top tier keys trying to get in at the same time versus all of the magic key holders trying right. to get at the same time versus everyone, general public key holders alike, trying to get at the same time. So I think in the long run, this feels like it's going to benefit everyone, whether you're the top key holder, you're not a key holder at all. I feel like it's going to be less people trying to access the queue at the exact same time. Sure, I do feel how people could be nervous about, oh, well, I don't have a key. I'm going to, you know, I just am going to get leftover, get the leftovers. But they are only releasing a limited number of tickets for the pre-sale for the Magic right. Key holders. So they shouldn't be selling out days before the general public gets the option, which I think is great. Plus, they have extra, they've added extra days. Yeah. Well, the notify me option is the thing I'm most excited about yeah. because one of the biggest problems is... You know, some of these times you get in these queues and literally you could be in them for hours. Mm -hmm. So having as long as you have a good notification for your email, as soon as that comes in, you could see it. So I tell you, I'm optimistic for this. This is my problem. These keys release. So right. We're in the Midwest. So when these keys are releasing, it's mid workday for me. So there have been times that I have stayed at work longer because my spot has not come up. But I do not want to leave that queue because I foolishly joined it on the work computer because I didn't think 
that my like phone was going to be able to have enough battery to sure. outlast the queue. So there's been times that I have yeah have stayed late because I foolishly joined from a stationary computer that I can't just go home with. <laughs> well, and we talked about this on our stream this weekend, too. That something that would be nice for these things is to have a lottery system instead mm-hmm. of having like just waiting in a queue and getting. I mean, the email is nice; it is a step in the right direction. But explain because you've talked about this lottery system. So explain like what you think would be good with the lottery system. So, yeah, so I think there's a couple different ways you could go with the lottery system. You could do a lottery system just purely for this. You know, I want to. I want to purchase tickets. And so you enter the lottery saying, I want to purchase tickets. The lottery would then spit out and say, congratulations, your window that you can go and your you can go purchase your tickets is, you know, this specific time. A, you don't have to wait in the virtual queue forever and maybe not get anything or are stuck there for hours or whatever. Yeah. And B, then you're not having to do like a lottery for a date because say there's maybe a couple of dates that you could do instead of maybe getting those states or maybe not you can just go in and see what's available when your your numbers up kind of like when you're at like like the deli at the grocery store you get like a number but you it's it's a time so they only assign a small amount of people to each time. per each time slot so then again you're not overloading the system or it could be like what they did for D23 with the big panels where you just say you kind of say these are my priority yep so my first priority is this state for the Star Wars night. My second priority is this date, third part, whatever. Prioritize what dates you're interested in. Right. And then you enter a lottery for those dates. And if you win the lottery, then you have the option to purchase tickets for those dates or yep. not. I just think... Yeah. That'd be a cool system. I feel like it's still... I mean, any way you look at this, it's out of your hands. It's completely up to whatever. The technology gods, yeah. fate, whatever you want to call it. But at least... This saves you the hours and hours and hours of waiting. Because like Oogie Boogie Bash is a great example. I waited in that line for hours and hours and hours. Now, thankfully, our good friends at Concierge were able to secure us tickets. But I waited just out of curiosity, even after they had secured us tickets, to see when my time came up. If we would have been relying on me, we would not have gone to Oogie Boogie Bash this past year. Because the dates that overlapped with our trip dates were already sold out by the time that was my turn. Same thing with people with magic keys. We had people in our chat that waited seven, eight hours to try and purchase a magic key this last time around that didn't end up being able to get one because they were sold out by the time, you know, it was their turn. I mean, I think that when when there's a virtual queue situation, if they're going to keep doing this, they know how many tickets they want to sell. So I feel like when you reach, you know, have a buffer a little bit, but once you reach that number of people who have waited, I think you cut the queue off at that point and say, that it's too. very unlikely that you're going to get this. If there are some left over after the people who are already in the virtual queue are done, we'll open a second window of it tomorrow or something. Sure. Yeah. Or maybe have the situation where like you just you do the notify me thing. And then if there are extra tickets in the order in which you did it, they can give you stuff, too. That's true. I don't know. There's all these different systems. But I feel like the system, whatever their system that they've been doing obviously it's not really working for most people. Like it's just, it's not a fun process at all. And I think it's tough because I think not that long ago they had these after hour events, but they just didn't have the insane demand that they do now. So I, I do feel for the people trying to figure out how to do this best because to me, it seems like it went up and the demand just went crazy like, I, I mean, it wasn't even that long ago that they still would be advertising that, oh, we still have tickets available for tonight's whatever themed oh, thing. Sure. And you could walk up the day of and purchase tickets for the specialty. You know, I think it was Sweetheart's Night that they had tickets for well, yeah. the first year that they did it. And I'm thinking like there was that, th- that grad, it was like the grad Throwback night. night. Not throwback. Oh, the it was, grad yeah, night. that grad night that it was like like the alumni yeah, night or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't remember what they called it. I feel like those both didn't sell fully out, so you could walk up and still buy tickets. Now you blink and everything's yeah. gone. It's just it's crazy. New for Star Wars night this year will be over 20 new treats available only during the party. Guests will join Mickey and Minnie in a march down Main Street and in at Sleeping Beauty Castle with a group photo and galactic projections on the castle. The cool thing with the march is it's like everybody that's 
dressed up for Star dressed Wars. up for Star Wars. So all the people in their like Star Wars best, which I'm telling you, if they would have done this when we were there, I would have watched that because those cosplayers were incredible. I distracted I like, we myself. Could talk all about. I know this I distracted myself from the story. Uh, well, there's also going to be a lightsaber instructional that will take place at It's a Small World Mall, a galactic dance party on Main Street. Captain Phasma and her stormtroopers will be over in Tomorrowland. And finally, there will be new places and faces available for photo opportunities. All right. Do you have more thoughts about the c- cavalcade? I think the cavalcade's cool. Would you not? I would have like, I mean, it was raining, so they maybe they were supposed to do it and they couldn't do it because it was raining. But that would have been so cool. There was... They said it's new for incredible this time. Incredible cosplayers when we were there last year. Just incredible. Like, to me, what made Star Wars Night was the fans more so than what the Disney event was. Because, man, those fans. Like, I'm thinking about that kid that we were standing in line behind. Oh, yeah. With the, the custom built lightsaber that he had this whole really cool story about the lightsaber that he, like, did all the pieces and, like, completely customized it out and like his outfit too he was talking about putting together anyway it's just cool yeah i think that this sounds good that they've added some different things of course they've got more food items and Mm -hmm. stuff like that uh you're right the costumes i think were really great i mean we saw a bunch of people in costumes it'd be cool to see them do that i like the fact that they're doing a group photo with it yeah i'm wondering if that's something that's going to be I feel like it's not likely for them to scan everybody's magic band for that. So I'm wondering if they just load it onto everybody who's attending the party oh. in their photo pass because photo pass is included with the yeah. ticket. So I'm wondering if they just do that, Maybe. which could be co- kind of cool because, you know, we had that guy. It would have been cool to, if he would have participated in that. We could have had a picture and been like, there's the cool guy we yep. keep talking about. Yep. So that would have been neat. It just seems like they're doing like this lightsaber instructional sounds really cool where you're going to be introduced to all new maneuvers crafted for this year's recruits. So, I mean, you would have been. I all about think it'd that. be so cool to do something like mm-hmm. that. They've got a DJ on Main Street for the dance party and all of that stuff. Bring the lightsabers, of course, to the Millennium Falcon mm-hmm. for the lightsaber thing. So, some of the food uh, at the Hungry Bear, they've got a street style elote burger. At Red Rose Tavern, they have a pork belly. Sisig inspired loaded fries. There's a pineapple and ube crescent sundae at the Tropical Hideaway. Chocolate funnel cake at the Stage Door Cafe. And at Royal Street Veranda, there is crab fritter. That sounds really good. Mm-hmm. And then there's specially menu items at Cafe Orleans. Reservations are recommended and can be booked online soon. Keep your eyes at Disneyland.com slash dining. I'm also curious to learn about, they're saying there's new places and new faces like what that characters? you can take photos with. So I'm curious what what new photo ops and what new characters are going to be at Star Wars night. But yeah. Do they still fun. have, I was trying to look at the fine print, which I didn't see. Usually for these after hours things, they'll tell you like, so they said that uh, popular attractions after regular oh, park yeah. hours. Well, I remember every time they've been like, well, Rise of the Resistance won't be. So I was curious because they yeah. didn't say that this time. So I'm like, and usually they say like in the, in the like fine print, but I don't see the fine print this time for that one. So hopefully interesting. I feel like it's a missed opportunity to not have Rise of the Resistance open for Star Wars right. night. But I get it. It's a very technical attraction. It takes a while for it to you know, for them to shut it down for the night. So, I mean, I understand, but come on. How cool. Oh, uh, yeah. Ride some of the park's most unforgettable Star Wars attractions, including Star Tours, the Adventures Continue, Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, and Star Wars Riders of the Resistance, subject to availability, which may vary and is not guaranteed. Yep. So which, they actually I mean, did add it, yeah, finally. Yeah, they did add it. And that makes sense with the whole subject to availability because it does, Break you know, down. have some some temper tantrums sometimes, you know. Sure. So, Some Disneyland cast members have joined a union. The cast member union effort, calling itself Magic United, will be represented by the Actors' Equity Association, a union who uh, currently represents performers and stage managers at Disney World, Broadway, and in many live theater productions around the United States. Magic United will include... Entertainment cast members, which includes theatrical parade and character performers, hosts, leads, and trainers that support the entertainment department are included as well. 1,700 cast members are eligible to join. Okay. I need to say this and get it out of the way before we talk about all the positive. I This was mind-boggling to me how the entertainment cast members were not represented by a union. They are some of the hardest working. They have the... Toughest physical, I mean, 
the physical demands, the stuff that they have to put up with, with, you know, guest interaction sometimes, because, right, characters can't break character even if a guest is not being Mm -hmm. very nice. We'll just leave it at that. But I'm just thinking about parade performers. We had someone on a while back talking about the demands of the parades and how it was something like what you, the pay was made no sense to me because if they weren't outperforming during the parade, but they had to still be there because there were two parades. They only actually got paid like for parade time, not necessarily time that they had to be there. Like, it was yeah. just, the whole thing was weird. And so I'm just, yeah, I, I don't know. This is long, long overdue. So congratulations to all of the entertainment cast members that this affects. I'm very, very excited. Well, it's for not all a done deal yet because the majority, I'm still excited. the majority of those 1700 cast members have to sign it. And then the union will ask Disney to recognize oh, it. Sure. And then if Disney does not voluntarily recognize it, actors equity representatives will follow a petition process established by sure. the National Labor Relations Board, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but I I'm just you, long but overdue. What I don't understand with, with these, with like our parade cast member friends and things like people that work on airplanes and stuff, I don't understand how is it legal to be required to be somewhere for work and not get paid for it. Like, Oh, like, like, like flight, like flight attendants. attendants. They yeah. only get paid when they're in the air. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a ton of work that you do that's not in the air. Yeah. So what is up with that? Yeah. How is that legal? Because like for you or me, our like places we've been employed, they always tell us, if you are here doing work, you must be on the clock. Mm-hmm. Remember, there was a place we used to work for, retail, that if we were walking to break and somebody stopped us and we helped them, we had to like note that time. We had to, then our break restarted kind of thing. Yeah. So I don't know how this works in these other industries. I don't know. It's just wild to me, but I'm, I'm very excited because think of like the people at Avengers campus doing all like the crazy stunts and you know, all the, uh, good for them. I really hope that this pans out and goes through and all that. Cause like I said, this feels so long overdue. I think, I think I just, was naive and assumed that they were protected by a union this whole time. But yeah, so that was pretty surprising. Yeah. Well, there's been a lot of construction going on around the resort recently. There's some attractions that are coming back soon, though. The Astro Orbiter is being reassembled for a March 15th reopening. The Mark Twain is finally wrapping up its extensive refurbishment and should be transporting guests as soon as this weekend. And last but certainly not least, Grizzly River Run will return just in time for the Food and Wine Festival on March 1st. You know, hang on, pause. Oh, oh, we oh. haven't talked about this. You want to know what else is returning? For what? March 1st for the Food and Wine Festival, Soren over California. Oh, yeah. I mean, I it is the superior version <laughs> of the Soren attraction. So the Mark Twain, I want to talk about the Mark Twain. So yeah. we have seen our friend David over at Fresh Baked uh, does a lot of videos about this. Lots of photos from Mice Chat and everything. I think it was not under refurbishment when we were there. Or was it? I think it was. It was. It's been for a while. Oh, yeah. December. Yeah. My the what I have gathered from this refurbishment is they basically stripped it down. Did the whole thing to yeah, it's almost <laughs> right. a complete rebuild. It yeah. feels like yeah. You know, we talk all the time about how we had that there was that auction and there was things there, and we're like, you mean it's not the same thing? Yeah. Uh, the Mark Twain that you board when this reopens will mostly not yeah. be the Mark Twain that we've ridden before. Right. It looks it's, amazing though. It does. So many people have said they have not seen it look this good. Like ever. ever. I mean, it is like blindingly bright white. It looks so crisp, so clean. I mean, look at the paddle. Have you ever seen the paddle on the boat? No. Look like that. I mean, it's you could eat off that thing. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not. Maybe don't do that. But I mean, (laughs) yeah, I'm really, I know we're not going to be there right away. We're going to be there mid April. I'm genuinely really excited to see this in person because the photos look. I mean, in the photos, it's still like partially under wraps, but it just it looks stunning. It does look stunning. I'm very excited. They've replaced every light bulb and uh, just everything. Mm-hmm. It's just oh, amazing. They redid the gold on the stacks. Yep. Yeah, shocker. Those have been gold for a while. You didn't know because there was so, there was so much like soot, you know, back or not whatever soot buildup that was on them. But the last time they are. Sp- I remember seeing them look like this was they got repainted for the 50th anniversary 
And there was like a 50th logo that they put up in sure. between the things. So that was the thing. I will say, even though I don't particularly care for the attraction, the Astro Orbiter is looking really great. Uh, the back paint from its stuff. looks cool. I like the silver paint. It's almost like holographic looking. Right oh. Now. Like it reminds me of the Platinum Mickey yeah, statue. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, over at Grizzly River Run, they've done a lot of work here as well. There's a ton of walls up right now getting a lot of things done. That geyser should hopefully be working when it <laughs> reopens. So It looks like they were working on the water wheel. A couple things that I wanted to bring up. So there's been some construction photos across from Grizzly River Run where they're rebuilding yeah. that like thing. I'm wondering, are they bringing back, they had that full body dryer that people <gasps> liked and that it was there and gone. Maybe. I'm wondering if there was structural issues or something. Maybe they're trying to reinforce it and they're going to have this because I think that's needed. People seem yeah. to like With, it. Uh, we could have used it that well, one trip around Especially the now river. that they're fixing the Yeah, now that the geyser, geyser is back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of course, Tiana's is coming along. Lots of stuff going on there. We won't talk about the trees at the... We're not, no, just okay. just keep scrolling past the mansion. It's too so, tough. But well, and really lots it's of things hard. getting it's, cleaned up. It's really hard. I'm curious for when... This is going to sound like such a Disney nerd thing, so I, I apologize. I know we're in safe company here, but I'm really excited for when the Mark Twain comes back. For the Mark Twain, yes. I'm 100% excited for the Mark for, Twain. To be able to see behind the construction. But I'm also excited for people to be able to see what's going on with the mansion behind the wall. Have you watched I'm David sure... from Fresh Baked? He's been on the island. Yeah, he's and... been trying his, his darndest to be able to peek through and see what's going on. He's trying to figure out what to do while the Mark Twain's not going to what it is because that's the perfect thing to be able to slowly roll by and look down into the queue area. I don't, however, I don't know if I want to see it because the stuff that we were seeing was kind of difficult to look at. And I think even clearly it's been some time. So even more stuff has been ripped up. I think the entire key, like we knew the backside of the queue was going to get ripped up. Yeah, I'm wondering how much of the front may have been yeah, ripped it's up looking and redone possibly too. Possibly like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a. I'm looking at this picture right now. Yeah, there's like there's some like a the, gear right there. Yeah, some sort of land mover thing I in the front yard. We'll say from this vantage point, the removal of the tree does make the mansion more visible. That's true because it was like covered there for a while. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention was David on Fresh Break when he went on Tom Sawyer Island. That it looks like they're renovating the stage for Fantasmic, which is also coming yeah. back in a few months. So yeah. that'll be exciting. Very exciting. Ugh. The Joffrey's Cappuccino Cart is sporting a new sign. The new sign for the location better fits in with the Big Hero 6 San Francisco theming that's just steps away. The new sign is similar to the old sign, but has more cups of coffee and some added Japanese characters, which translate to gourmet coffee. Oh, that's fun. I just, I think it makes total sense. And honestly, it seems like, with how San Francisco has, it feels like San Francisco has been wrapped up for a while now. So it's interesting the delay between when San Francisco wrapped up to when they decided to update the Joffrey's or the Cappuccino Carts sign. But they're still adding bits and pieces that all over are. the land. That they are. But I think it's really fun. I think the colors are nice and fun and bright. And like, I don't know, it's a little whimsical with the beans kind of spilling out over the cups and the, the swirls of bright yellow steam and then the little i don't know they're almost like they kind of remind me of scrabble pieces the pieces that yeah. have the the japanese let's characters. be honest they could have a paper sign up there and you would still i mean i'd be excited there. yeah well yeah i don't know if i'd be excited about the sign but of course i'd buy coffee there still well in celebration of duck days this weekend disney has released what limited time treats and merch will be available mini ears of course and a spirit jersey plus a hockey puck are all available well in terms of treats there is a chicken fried steak burrito an orange cocktail a chocolate mousse cake with medallion and a fly together cake pop that looks like a hockey puck the cake pop looks really good, but I have my eyes on this chocolate mousse cake. It looks like, cake. you think it's supposed to be a Zamboni? Because it's got little wheels Probably. on the side. <laughs> but it looks like the middle part looks like it's the gray stuff mm-hmm. or something similor. And there I would totally go. eat this. It's like, oh, it looks like so good. Like an chocolate Oreo mousse. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Orange cocktail? I Literally, there's no info yeah, about it. Just no, an orange cocktail. There's no description, just orange cocktail. So I'm I'm impartial. How about the chicken fried steak burrito? I'm going to say this. It might get a little... It does not look appetizing. The photo does not look appetizing to me mm. at all. I I might eat it. <laughs> yeah. No, it does not look like it's up my... Okay. Up my Better alley. question. Ears. The ears are cute. If I was a hockey fan, 100% okay, I would get those gonna ears. You are going to laugh at Because me. the ears look like... The ears themselves look like pucks. There's a nice emerald green bow with crossed stick. 
sticks. You're going to laugh Very at me. Very good. I looked at this when I was writing this. Like, I looked at this ears, like, probably six or seven times. I just noticed before you said it that these were hockey sticks. This, I could I could forgive you if you didn't realize that the ears themselves were pucks because sure. they're just circle. You know, it's a circle. So I could understand that. But the hockey sticks? My eyes were drawn sir. to the emblem that says fly together in the middle. I don't know why. That's the only thing I happen to notice. But... For for Ducks fans, lots of cool stuff. There is something, I will try and find it to be able to share a link, but there is Magic Key Holders have a special gift. It looks like... For the Ducks days? For the Ducks days. It looks like a like a towel, like a little towel, like mm. a fan towel, What it is what it looks like. I will find the link so that we can throw it in the show notes because I do not remember off the top of my head. I'm assuming you can go pick this up. At the base of the Silly Symphony Swings, where they typically do the Magic Key giveaways, do not quote me on that. I'm sure. not 100%. But I will find that information. I will include it in this week's Show episode notes. notes. Yeah. Well, it's that time again for our friend Eric over at Concierge to catch us up on other Disney news. Hello, everyone. This is Eric Johnson with Concierge, and welcome to the D180. While Teg and Teresa cover all things Disneyland, in the D180, we take a spin around the rest of the Disney universe, and we do it in 180 seconds. Let's jump right in. We start this week in Germany again because you know I enjoy talking about the Disney Cruise Line's newest ship, the Disney Adventure. It's hard to believe this ship will head out for its maiden voyage later this year. The builders have come so far from January 2023, where the first pieces of steel were cut. The latest news is fairly cosmetic, if anything. The bow of the ship now features a golden image of Captain Minnie Mouse. She's decked out in her Adventureland gear with a spyglass to help guide the ship on its way. Surrounding Minnie is a bevy of golden curls that blend in with the signature golden stripe that surrounds the ship. Look close and count how many times you see Pluto worked into the design of those curls. Let's take a quick jaunt across the Atlantic to Disneyland Paris. Their flagship hotel, the aptly named Disneyland Hotel, recently reopened with a fresh look and immersive theming. The Disneyland Hotel in Paris has the distinction of not just looking into the park, but being inside it. This five-star establishment is doubling down on its ability to deliver the royal treatment to its guests. And wow, the new theme pulls this off with perfection. What better place to celebrate the princesses and royalty of Disney animation than in the land of classic French castles? The new lobby is all marble, dark wood, and ivory tones with ample natural light. Overhead, a brand new crystal chandelier depicts Sleeping Beauty Castle in a new way. Composed of layers of crystal, the chandelier gives the effect that the brightly lit castle is floating overhead. It looks absolutely gorgeous. The all-new rooms feature lush and calm colors with plenty of gold accent. Elements from 11 Disney films are woven everywhere from the carpets to mirror frames. And talk about the royal treatment. Every room has a pillow menu. Yeah, a pillow menu. Choose from seven different pillow styles to suit your sleeping needs. In a similar fashion of the Disneyland Hotel in Anaheim, the bedtime experience comes with a bit of a light show. The canopy above your beds illuminates and the artwork around the room comes to life with extra enchantments. For those looking for an even more elevated experience, stay at the club level where princess character dining is just another normal start to your day. As with many of the top Disney hotels, those seeking the absolute top of the line a five-star hotel can provide will not be disappointed. The signature suites at the Paris Disneyland Hotel are themed around Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Anna and Elsa, Rapunzel, Belle, and even a princely beast suite. These places look like something out of a period film with amenities you can only dream of. Traveling to Paris isn't as hard as you might think. Reach out to our expert concierge planners and they will help you set up the Disneyland Paris trip of your dreams. From travel to rooms at any of the resort's seven hotels to stroller and scooter rentals, we can arrange anything you need. I hope you enjoyed our quick spin around the rest of the Disney universe. If you would like to learn more about these Disney adventures or just have a few questions, please come on over. Visit the social media and websites of both DL Weekly and us, their official travel planners, Concy Ears. We look forward to planning something special for you and yours. I'm Eric Johnson, and this has been your D180. Thanks, Eric. 
I up, down, touch the ground, I think of things to chew. Like honey and milk and chocolate. With a hefty, happy appetite, I'm a hefty, happy poo. A rumbly in my tumbly means it's time for snacks. Well, this week for Snack Chat, we are trying to limit ourselves. If you want to hear, <laughs> if you want to hear our full breakdown and review of the new foodie guide for Food and Wine Fest, please visit our YouTube page. We just hosted a public live stream this past Sunday and we went through this and Tag got really excited. I think we even like are scrolling, sharing our screen and scrolling through so you can look at all the delicious photos along with us. So because we kind of went through everything in depth and we knew we had a very awesome, very lengthy, which is also awesome, interview lined up for you. We didn't want to spend too much time going over every single item with you again. However, so Teresa I, wanted me to pull out good things, and I have he a, has a, a dozen good list anyway. So we're going to go through them because there are a lot of them, thankfully, are on both of our lists. So starting at the California Craft Brews booth, I am really excited. The s'mores tart. The s'mores caramel tart has caught my eye. It is a graham cracker tart shell filled with caramel and chocolate ganache topped with a toasted marshmallow. That's that on my list too. Is like a must try for me. The cheeseburger bao with Thousand Island dressing, grilled onions, pickle, and tomato relish sounds really good because mm-hmm. I like bao mm-hmm. buns anyway. And I think the idea of having like a Thousand Island, I don't know. There's a lot of things that sound interesting. That's also a California craft brews. Did you have anything from Cluckadoodle Moo? Cluckadoodle Moo, of course I do, because they have a kiwi apple lemonade, which is Minute Maid lemonade, apple juice, and kiwi with Granny Smith apple syrups garnished with a purple orchid. It is non-alcoholic. I think I'm going to try this. (gasps) It looks so good. This might be one of those ones that we get one, and, and then, then you're like, we both nope, get we one. Need, we need two, because it's amazing. Yeah, I'm I want to try it so bad. that kitchen drink, that coffee oh, drink. Oh, the, 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 the cookies and cream cold brew? Sure. Was there, were, were you, you didn't want to pick the uh, pizza wings? No, I'm very confused about the cheese pizza flavored wings. I look forward to seeing other people's. We're, we're going, when we're there, it's literally the last weekend of Food and Wine Fest. So we will be able to see what everybody else has thought about the food. To narrow Plenty our list down. To know, because, yeah, I'm just real confused about the cheese-flavored wings. <laughs> Can you talk cheese about the pizza-flavored delish wings. item? Because you are definitely going to eat it where I might only have a bite. Oh, sure. So but it's on my list. So over at Delish, there's actually two things that I'm curious about. I'm excited about the olive oil cake, which is glazed with lemon curd, topped with vanilla bean chantilly, and finished with fresh candied lemon, strawberry crunch, and a lemon lime gl- jelly. jelly. So I put that on the list. I'm not a oh, lemon looks, fan, it looks beautiful, but it though. looks so good. It looks really good. So I want to try it. I'm also going to get the Huckleberry Citrus Cooler because it's, of course, it's another flavored What's that beverage. One? But it's gold peak black tea, huckleberry, and agave syrups, grapefruit soda, and lemon and orange juices garnished with an orange wedge. Are we literally just going to like be moseying around the park mm-hmm. and just eating all yeah. day? Okay. 100%. At Earth Eats, I've got two things okay, listed here. Okay, before we even go, I need to point out how exciting it is that there is a plant-based booth this year for the sure. festival, Earth Eats. All right. The two things I put down were the impossible chicken parm bites with tomato and cheese sauces and grated Parmesan, mm-hmm. and also the impossible beef stroganoff, which are egg noodles tossed in a mushroom cream sauce with impossible beef and sour cream. Yum. You have tried the impossible things. I have tried your impossible things, and I have never been let down no. when you've been like, try this. In fact, we but were But I've just... never had impossible chicken, so that'll be interesting. I have, well, not impossible brand, but I have faux chicken in my freezer right now. Oh. We could remedy this for you real no, quick. No, no, we'll just wait until the chicken farm <laughs> bites. Do you have anything from... My next thing is at Uncork, California. That's where I'm... Oh, no, I'm going to Golden Dreams next because I really want to try this frozen old fashion. It's a non-alcoholic bourbon-flavored ice cream, bitters crema, orange zest glaze, and cherry spheres. I don't know why... But I just is that that I really, ice cream bar yes, looking it's thing? Yes, this ice cream bar looking thing. I am so curious about this. So yeah, I, I am curious list. to see people's reviews of these things. <laughs> All right, are you down to uncork and yet? And then, not yet. Of course, 
There's a fig matcha latte that I've, I I kind of want to try too. It's matcha, soy milk, and coconut and simple syrup, topped with a fig oat sweet cream, garnished with matcha, hmm. like the powder. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Uncorked? Are you done uncorked? I'm yet? done. Oh, L.A. style. There's a lot of things going down the oh, list before me. There probably. is uh, L.A. style. I am curious to try the Baja style fish taco. It is plant based with cabbage slaw, cilantro, lime crema, and pico. So wait a second. The taco, the fish, the fish taco. taco it's a plant the fish, fish is plant based. Yeah. So not only will I try the chicken, mm-hmm. but I'll try plant based fish. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, apparently there was a lot before I got down to my next thing. My Ooh, next thing in Uncorked, California put, okay. is the raspberry almond cake, which is an almond cake with raspberry mousse and fresh raspberries. It looks really good. It it's does. in the photo. It does look good. It Sadly, it looks like it's kind of a... The picture, maybe the picture is misleading. It looks like it's a small portion. Well, yeah, all of them So small I'm portions. hoping it's not like too small. The Boardwalk Pizza and Pasta, I put down the no-bake peanut butter salted pretzel cheesecake yes. with the cookies and cream crust topped with chocolate-coated salted pretzels and chocolate ganache. If you want to talk about small portions, that looks like it's going to be a small portion, if you look at the photo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, over the cappuccino cart, I'm very excited to try the honeydew milk tea with coconut lychee jelly topped with a creamy citrus foam. Oh, yum. All of these drinks. You're not going to have Every room time, for all these I drinks. I just like, yeah. I just I just love all the drinks. They're so good. What happens if you find something you really, truly love and want a second one, but you don't have enough I don't. I can't gotta... tag. I have to limit myself. Um, like you said, there's only so much room in the stomach. I am very excited for the Claire Bell's hand-scooped ice cream. There's a butter cake a la mode with butter cake topped with vanilla ice cream, strawberries, and whipped cream. Mm-hmm. I love a good strawberry shortcake, and this just adds ice cream to it, so I'm very excited for that. There you go. And then over at Cocina Cucamonga, strawberry horchata, house-made Rice and cinnamon beverage with strawberries. Isn't I don't like know a ton why. of horchata there this time. Oh no, this is the first horchata. No, but I'm saying, isn't there a bunch of horchatas there, like at that location? Because see, there's the strawberry horchata. There's... That one's with rum. It's, oh, it's a strawberry horchata and then the strawberry gotcha. horchata with rum. <laughs> Same uh, thing, just boozy gotcha. and non boozy. At Lamplight Lounge, the strawberry likey uh, short. Cake donuts, which are likey glazed donuts with strawberry shortcake crumbles and serve with vanilla bean ice cream and likey dip. Sounds really great. Mm-hmm. And I think that's about the- I got two more. Oh, of course you do. Sonoma Terrace, the charcuterie flatbread, chef selection oh. of deli and cured meats, mozzarella, caramelized onions, and chopped with pepperoncini, served with pepperoncini dip. This looks like a flop over from Toontown, but like a charcuterie like, board. Like a fancy flop It looks over. good. And finally, churros at Hollywood Land, the cannoli churro, a churro oh. rolled in cinnamon sugar topped with cannoli cream, chocolate chips, and puff pastry. Did you piss skip? I, I did. thought you had one of the. I did. So at the Paradise Garden Grill, there is a pineapple melon cocktail. So it's melon liqueur, pineapple juice, and a splash of citrus that looks really, really delicious. It looks delicious. like uh, Neon radioactive. green. Yes, it yes. does. Yes, it does. Wasn't there a churro you were excited about that wasn't just the cannoli one? I was also interested in trying the butterscotch banana churro, mm. which is over at Willie's Churro. It's a churro rolled in banana sugar topped with butterscotch icing and butterscotch drops with banana chips crumbled on top. That might be good because my concern, I didn't read the description. My concern with that is sometimes when you get stuff that's banana, it's like real, like banana is really a strong flavor a lot of times. But this just has banana chip crumble. So it sounds like it maybe is rolled in banana sugar. But maybe it's like, okay, so the banana chip crumble is maybe like dehydrated pieces of banana. That might be good. That's exactly what it is. It's really banana. Great. You can see them in the photo there. Yeah, they're just smaller banana. But the banana chips. sugar, I'm worried about because that might have that like. You know how banana has that like fake banana I, flavor. But see, I like the fake banana oh. flavor. I like am one of the people that really enjoys banana runs. Okay, okay, you're that person. I don't know if I would like a banana runt flavor on a churro mm. necessarily. I think a more more natural banana flavor on the churro would could work really really well. You know what sounds really good right now? A churro. <laughs> So on the Facebook group for the cruise I'm going on for the Disney cruise, oh. the the one thing that people were saying are like, what are must eat things on the ship? And people are obsessed with these churro Mickey shaped waffles. Yes, I've heard of these. You didn't have I it? did not try them. I didn't notice that. We only did the. But they're not every morning. They're yeah. like only some mornings. Yeah, we did the breakfast buffet, I think 
only one or two of the and morning it wasn't and we did the days. like seated breakfast the other oh. mornings like the restaurant breakfast so i learned about the churro mickey waffles after the cruise well missed opportunity there you go well you better book another disney cruise or two to get on yeah. there and do that <laughs> just to, just to experience the yeah. churro waffles well if you could get 10 percent off of your support of the podcast and only have to pay once a year instead of monthly would that be enough to make the final push to become an official weekly tier and get some great perks as well well if so we're offering just that head on over to dealweekly.net slash support to sign up or you can convert your existing support to the annual level as well <laughs> DL Weekly announces the boarding of the Trivia Express, nonstop star speeder service to the moon of Endor. All passengers, please prepare for immediate boarding. Hello and welcome to Trivia Land. I am glad you are back, even though you keep on going to snack chat before you come here. I mean, it's pretty delicious over there, so... We have so many things to talk about. It feels like... Has it... Is it just me? Or are there more foodie guides lately? (laughs) I don't know if there actually is or just feels like there is. It just is. feels like there it is. Does. Well, just... I mean, it's it's also the start of the year. So we just had Lunar New Year plus the Celebrate Soulfully sure. plus now Food and Wine Fest. Okay. So I just okay. feel like there's been a lot. Pa- and prior to that, then we had the holidays, Festival of the Holidays sure. and the holiday time one. So, so James, where you and Vern, what are you bringing to Trivia Land? I don't know. I'm waiting for our fun festivals. I will <laughs> I will say that I do think that we get the most positive feedback about mm-hmm. trivia. Like when people write in, they usually specifically call out trivia as something that they enjoy about the podcast. We're just something it's fun and interactive. It's our it's our banter back and forth and trivia are like the two big things. Yeah, I'm trying to decide if it's like you two struggling that they really enjoy <laughs> or uh, could be. I think they enjoy learning new things about the park even whether we know them or not. There you go. At least well, enough talk about like rubbing my ego let's uh see if we can bruise yours with our four trivia questions this week wow playing the part of Vern this week is james who's gonna (laughs) hit us with the hard trivia questions i think you'll do okay this week they're all my questions so you only have me to blame okay so are they costume related questions because we don't do very good on this you know what let's just get to it you'll have to wait and see (laughs) yeah your first question what 3D film was the first to play at the Magic Eye Theater in Tomorrowland? Oh, I think that was Captain, Captain EO. Captain EO. Captain EO, not Captain EO. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just the way you enunciated that. I'm like, that doesn't sound I'm like, right. what are you talking about? Oh, yeah. It's Captain EO, yeah, not I know. EO. Yeah. I know. I'm like, as soon as you said it, I'm like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because afterwards they did, you know what's funny? I, for the longest time, wanted them to bring Honey, I Shrunk the Audience from Disney World. And then when they did, and I like experienced it like eight times, I was like, okay, that's good. I don't need I to do that anymore. Cute. It is cute. It is cute. I love the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids franchise. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. All right. Moving on. Apparently we're number taking two. a side trip to Nostalgia Land. At the same yeah. Time. It's going well. Speaking of nostalgia, I asked you this same question back in episode 217. I mean, that was over 100 episodes ago, James. (laughs) It's only like two years ago, right? I remember it as it were yesterday. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll find out. You'll get this one just (laughs) perfectly correct. There was a foodie guide we talked about, I'm sure. (laughs) Probably some new ears. Yeah. My goodness. Okay. (laughs) I want to know if you can remember what national park inspired Big Thunder Mountain. Oh, Bryce Canyon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, well, because what happens is confidence. I was watching, like, I remember watching the behind the attraction about Big Thunder, and they talked about how each of the Big Thunders around the world are themed off of different areas, but Bryce Canyon, I believe, was the one for Big Thunder Mountain in I Disneyland. Want to, I have not been yet, but I... You're going to laugh. Prior Where to, is Bryce Canyon? Prior to Disney. My Disneyland love. This was separate, and now I like extra have to go. But like that's a thing. That's so I have a Disney bucket list, but I also want to visit all of the national parks. And I feel like this is kind of like a a double, right? Mm. Because it's a national park plus it's a national park with kind of like a Disney connection. You know who would love you? Our grandma. Our grandma always says, "Why do you keep going to Disney? Why don't you go visit the national parks?" (laughs) Bryce Canyon National Park is in Utah. Utah. Mm -hmm. Where in Utah? 
like in relation to Bryce Canyon City. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. Where's Salt <laughs> no, Lake from? I'm it, going, I'm question. going, I'm going. Oh, so between Salt Lake City and Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of near the Grand Canyon in yeah. a way. Interesting. Okay. Not too far. All right. So I, I'm assuming, Tag, you're going with that one too? Yes, of course. Of, of course. Yeah, yes. confidently. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's go for a, another journey. Question number three is an audio clue. Can you tell me what attraction this is from? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, this is from Alice, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. That's impressive that you got that playing on your phone when that's also where you're doing the trivia from. I am making magic happen over here. Yeah. The magic of Trivia Land. I was like, I may as well be an Imagineer at this point. It rate, is a so. magical place, that Trivia Land. Mm-hmm. Are you both ready for your last question? Yes. All right. Tag, you asked if there was going to be a costume question. Oh, Lord. There's a costume Just question. Just for you, Tag. Just for you. He's like, I went and found one that I had yep. laying around. Because had to go and that. change it out to make sure that it fits sure. in for you. No, I had this ready for you. Okay. You just read my mind. All right. This playful costume features a short sleeve shirt with a horizontal color block design. Featuring bright yellow on the torso, red on the sleeve edge, and a pair of blues are involved as well. They're also wearing a red cap. Completing the outfit are dark blue, maybe black pants. I don't remember exactly. They seem to be a pretty standard fit and some comfy black shoes. Is this the El Capi tune? I feel... Maybe not. Like I feel like it's no, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, kind of. Can you... Is there... I'm sorry, James. Oh, but there's stripes is there a on them, different so no. way you could describe the shirt? Because I'm having a hard time visualizing. You're using words that make sense to me, but for some reason, my brain is not interpreting them correctly. Sure. So short sleeve shirt. Yeah. Red, you got that? Red on the, red on the edge of the <laughs> sleeves. Red on the so edge like of trim. the sleeves. Yeah. Okay. And then there's like a couple of blocks that are shades of blue that are kind of on the shirt. When design. you say blocks, you talking like a checkered board? No, pattern? no, no, not that much. It's more like, uh, it's not like a, a stripe in the way that you imagine, but it kind of takes up a similar amount of space in the stripe. Not necessarily horizontal, though. So they're like strong, solid. With a red hat. Catching the blue. Yeah, kind of like. Uh, what oh, type of hat? It reminds me of like a felt beret in the pictures I saw. I don't really remember seeing it that often on the cast members when we've been there. But that's that's the distinct look that I had with it. Because I keep thinking, what's the costume? Well, it's not that anymore because it's Pixar Pier. Because when it was Paradise Pier, they had like a weird, colorful costume. I'm almost thinking like, no, it's a small world is light blues and yeah. white. Oh, yeah, that's white. Yeah. That's more like the, the fantasy. And the beret thing stuff. would not be, would no, not be would Mickey's. would not be Mickey and the Minis. Can you like... Mm, I would ask you to tell us what park, but that's probably too big of a hint. Yeah, that's probably too big of a hint. I mean, if you really want the hint, I can give you the hint. Oh, do you want the hint of what park is, it's in? Oh, oh, is it the Little Mermaid? Oh, could be. Is it Ariel? Well, but Adventure? the thing is, is don't they have like a don't they have like a red sash thing that like hangs down, like like it looks like a belt, but it's like a scarf almost. That's not part of it, is it, James? There is no scarf. No. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, it's not a scarf. It's a belt that oh, yeah. looks like a scarf. No, nope. the red is purely on the sleeve edge. the The shirt is distinctly what yellow. What does Midway Mania look like? I can't think of that one off the top of my head. I want to say that one looks like class. I want to say there's like <laughs> or, some browns or, or something. Pause. Is it Luigi's? Could be Luigi's. I'm gonna go with Luigi's. I'll hitch my car to your dancing. My dancing roadster. car. Yeah. Luigi's Rowlick and Roadsters. All right. That's our four questions this week. We'll find out if they're going to be singing some Hey Mamo mm. after, uh, after our discussion topic. Well, joining us this week, we have a returning guest. Alex is back. He's one of the hosts from the Backside of Water podcast. Alex, welcome back. We're happy to have you. Guys, it is always a pleasure to be part of DL Weekly. I like to consider myself one of the most important weekly tiers in my own oh, mind. So you if you go. guys want to ever create a hall of fame, you probably <laughs> shouldn't include me, but I will, I will 
copy and paste myself into pictures whenever you I know, see Alex, that Hall of every, Fame. <laughs> every weekly tier is a Hall of Fame weekly tier for us. Yes. You say that to every weekly tier. We do. Don't I you? just said every weekly tier is <laughs> every listener is important and special, and we're appreciative. Yes. Well, Alex, since you joined us back on episodes 274 and 275 to talk about your time in the jungle, for those of you that may have listened to those, we kind of cut off right before we realized Alex also had spent some time in. The mountains, I guess you yes. would say. And yeah, you I was a some time in front. Yeah, you spent some time in Frontierland. So let's just jump on in and talk about the transition from the jungle to the I Wild told West. Teresa just before yeah. you started, I told Teresa, I was like, what are we talking to Alex about? And she goes, his time working in Big Thunder. And I said, oh, I'm going to have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully I can answer them. Hopefully, because the... Big Thunder is is interesting in it's an extremely high volume, high safety attraction. And so when it comes to who is able to operate that attraction, it's a very specific echelon of cast member. And for a time, it was actually transferred back over to Fantasyland. Really? Fantasyland, yeah. So... When I was there, we'll, we'll rewind. And I I was there starting in 07. And during that time, it was Adventure Frontierland attractions. But with Adventure Frontierland, that also included Main Street. So it was Adventure Frontier and Main Street. Hmm. <laughs> and so we would do, we were in charge of Jungle Cruise, Indiana Jones, the Enchanted Tiki Room, Big Thunder Mountain. All of the outdoor vehicles, so all the mains that go up Main Street, oh. Main Street, USA, those were all covered by our cast members, steam trains, and the Opera House. So great moments wow. with Mr. Lincoln. So those were all of the things. And then we would also cover parades. So a parade, whenever you see those cast members on Main Street, those are Adventure Frontierland cast members. Wow. So <laughs> we had a big, big swath that we were we were in charge of. And I think because of that, they were like, we probably need to share the wealth here <laughs> with other lands. And I think that that's why they brought Frontierland over to Fantasyland. But from my understanding now, it is back in the hands of Adventureland. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe one of your listeners has a little bit more insight into it. But when I was there, that's exactly the way that it works. And the way that Big Thunder Mountain worked is it was what was called a cross train only attraction. And that means that it's an attraction that somebody who is new to the park can't just come in and automatically mm -hmm. be trained to work on Big Thunder Mountain. So there's actually a hierarchy when it comes to how you train on a Disney attraction. And there's new higher attractions, which are, at least in that area, there was Jungle Cruise and Indiana Jones. So any new, anybody who was new who came into the park would either be, if they were in Adventure Frontier, they were just shoved into Jungle Cruise or hmm. Indiana Jones. Hmm. And I, I think we even talked about this on the episode that I was on. I was so stoked that I was shoved into Jungle Cruise instead of Indiana Jones. And... As a result of of getting into an attraction that is a new higher attraction, Disney management is essentially kind of using that as a, a, an interview process to sure, see yeah. if you if you are the kind of material that's able to be put into the into the big leagues, which is <laughs> kind of what Big Thunder Mountain was. And the reason why Big Thunder Mountain was considered a more volatile ride is because in uh, just around that period, a few years previously, there was the massive, massive tragedy that happened on Big Thunder yeah. Mountain. Yeah. And as a result, there was a lot of a lot of pressure sure. on Big Thunder Mountain as an attraction. And with that, safety was insanely obsessed about on that attraction mm -hmm. when ironically it wasn't necessarily a cast member safety issue that was the result of the tragedy. The, right. the, the tragedy happened 
as a result of a faulty upstop on one of those trains. And it caused the main locomotive to derail, essentially pop up and then land on the front car is is essentially how that happened. What was the what was the can you define that term for me? The the uh, what did you say? Like up stop. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just throwing yeah. out terms here. <laughs> so there's something called an upstop and it's designed actually to prevent exactly what happened oh. on Big Thunder Mountain. So essentially when you when you see the the tube coasters the way they are, you've got the rails on top that have the wheels rolling on top, but then you also have a set of wheels underneath the track that roll underneath. And the goal and purpose of those is if there's any sort of airborne behavior that happens on one of those trains, it literally does what it's defined as is it stops it from going up. It's the up stop. Sense. And so it essentially just sucks it to the tube uh, rails. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, those up stops had become faulty. Mm -hmm. And at one turn, they broke off and the train popped up, became airborne as a result of those falling off or breaking oh, off yeah, yeah. and when it when it landed back down that's when the person was pinned mm. in there yeah yeah that's awful so yeah it was it was a horrific horrific tragedy mm -hmm. and yeah. and it's one of those things that i will say this there's a lot of people who kind of want to know and i've talked about this a number of times that there's there's people who are really like fascinated by tragedies at right. disney things like this or things that have happened on space mountain or mm -hmm. on the sailing ship Columbia, yeah. whatever it may be. And I mean, I think I understand from a human standpoint, while we're fascinated by that, why we slow down during car accidents and stuff yeah. like that. But what I will say is from a Disney perspective, every single one of those incidents is considered the most like sacred, horrific incidents that can happen nobody ever takes it lightly nobody yeah. ever jokes about it nobody ever is taking it to a place where it just feels inappropriate sure. whenever you're yeah. whenever you something like that is talked about it's talked about with almost like hushed restriction and it's not because they're like oh i'm afraid somebody's gonna sue us because those things have already ended i think what happens is disney really does a great job of respecting yeah. tragedy and they they respect the situations that occurred, not just because of a legal standpoint, but because of a humanitarian standpoint mm -hmm. that yeah. somebody's life was lost in these things. And so whenever I see a lot of these social media creators who are like crazy things that happened at Disney that resulted in death, part 26, I'm like, <laughs> oh, guys, this is yeah. ugly. Yeah. This is yucky. It, yeah, it's, it's disrespectful. Yeah. But but with that, there's a lot of weight on Big Thunder Mountain that yeah. comes because of that tragedy that happened in the early 2000s. And so that kind of sets the tone for the way that Big Thunder is referenced as a, a new hire cast member. When you hear people going to Big Thunder, one, you're like, holy crap, that's, that's a lot of responsibility. And two, you're like, that person is kind of going somewhere because they've been brought up from the lowers and now they're going into the, into the mm. uppers, if you will. I don't know. Maybe that's not the best term into like a better place, but yeah. maybe that's not <laughs> the term either. Anyway, don't worry, they're in a better place now. Big yeah. thunder. Usually what happens is there is a, a period of time where you are on what's called probation, which it sounds like a, 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 a bad thing but it's really neutral it's a neutral experience that everybody goes through that you have a 90 day probationary period and within that 90 days you're not able to move from your attraction you just have to basically show your muster on your attraction for that period of time so i remember i was on about day 75 day 80 of of my probationary period and i had a manager and one of my leads pull me back into the area behind the Bengal barbecue. And they were like, hey, we wanted to talk to you. And I was like, oh, gosh, what does this mean? <laughs> and they were like, we want you to come over to Big Thunder. And 
my lead knew that I I bled jungle water, that that's like all I wanted to do was be on the jungle cruise. Yeah. And so I was like, guys, you know that my heart is on the jungle cruise. I do everything to be on the jungle cruise. And they were like, we get that. That makes total sense. But keep in mind, if you ever want to become a trainer on the jungle cruise, you're going to have to go to Big Thunder. Like that's just, that's the way that this works. And I was like, oh. If you shave, if you, you your future it. as a trainer, <laughs> you <clears throat> tricked me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Just when I think I'm out, and they pull me back in. <laughs> so, to me, that was a no brainer. Mm-hmm. I had the goal of of becoming a Jungle Cruise trainer and a lead. That was that was my trajectory, and that was the path that I thought I wanted to take. So I was like, okay, this is this is a necessary part of that journey. And so that's what led me over to Big Thunder Mountain was that desire to really become a better cast member. So then I could become a Jungle Cruise trainer at that point. So with that, I I started my journey and it was an intense training period. There was a lot. There's a lot of buttons. There's a whole lot of buttons and a lot of calls that you have to do. And there's a lot of requirement. If Jungle Cruise and Big Thunder were to be compared and we were to use the metaphor of a vehicle, Jungle Cruise is a bicycle and Big Thunder Mountain is like an F-16 fighter jet. (laughs) <laughs> that's the 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 vast difference what, between Jungle Cruise, those you got the two little, attractions like, go forward go back y- yep the fake yep. steering wheel that doesn't really and, do anything yeah. yeah you might you might jump the yeah. track but and 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 if you do you shoot your gun six times yeah and yeah. and and there you go i mean again the biggest part about the jungle cruise and there's some people who would disagree with me because those people who look at the jungle cruise they're like but you have to steal yeah. you have to have yeah. your your specific timing there's a lot of differences between those two that a lot of people would love just to be on a push button attraction to me as you guys know I'm a talker I love to talk and so that was a piece of cake for me a jungle cruise but when I went over and I I sat in the tower which is basically when you're standing in the queue area and you're you're getting grouped into your trains if you look straight ahead of you and you see those cast members up above that big wall that's the tower that's where they're seeing where all the trains are in all the different zones and they're watching to make sure that there's no funny business and that trains aren't passing into each other's zones otherwise it breaks down the ride completely that tower is is basically the most stressful part of working on Big Thunder Mountain because you've got roughly six different screens, eight different screens in front of you, and you have to watch every single one of them wow. as they're passing up the lifts, and then they're passing through different ride sections, making sure that those trains are on proper timing because it is designed as such that if one of those passes through, one of those breaks into another train zone, it shuts the whole ride down. Mm. And a lot of times, you as the tower operator are the one who is responsible when that shuts down. And that's not something that you love to have on your shoulders. Oh, I'm sure not. Oh, I'm sure not. Because then you have to reset. And that you bring up a good point, because I don't think maybe people that listen to the podcast, because uh-huh. we know the ins and outs of Disney. But I, a lot of people I don't think realize, because they always think when rides go down, oh, it's broken. But no, that's usually it's something as simple as, no, the timing got off and it it was not within whatever the timing safety standards are that you'd want to, yes. however you say that. So they they do it for safety. It's not that anything was broken. It just then takes time to clear everybody out and get everything reset and all that fun yes. stuff. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is there's, if, if any listeners out there have any questions about Disneyland safety, I, mm. I would dispel that in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. There is, there is no place that is more focused yeah. on safety than Disney. Period. Mm -hmm. Period. Full stop. Because the amount of training and the amount of fail safes that you have are absolutely ludicrous. Whenever there's a a, a tragedy or an accident or an injury that occurs at Disney, it's because it's an absolute fluke, freak, crazy thing that happens that you could never plan for. It's like somebody getting hit 
by debris that fell out of an airplane toilet. It's like you can't plan for those types right. of things. That's the level of safety that Disney puts out there. And so whenever people ever worry or question about the safety standards of a Disney park, I think that there really is there's a significantly bigger risk with you walking out your front door, getting into your car and driving to work than ever going on something like Big Thunder Mountain or Space Mountain or Mission Breakout, whatever you, you well, have Well, I out think there. based off the story, you know, the history of the attraction and the tragedy that you spoke about, you know, I always try to tell people when a tragedy happens somewhere, whatever that, tra- wherever that tragedy happens, if, if it's an attraction or... We joked because one of the cruise ships we went on a long time ago was one of the ones that, like, the engine had caught fire a few years before. I'm like, they. That engine's never going to catch yeah, fire again. I'm like, yeah. that ship is probably the safest ship in their fleet to be on because they're like, we can't have the same ship catch fire again. So I feel like Big Thunder is definitely one of those attractions that. That there something has happened. It was a tragedy. Mm-hmm. We're not yeah, going to allow it with, to happen again. Well, and with that, I think they reevaluate everything. Well, that's true. Yep. So, yes. like, that you know, like Big Thunder Mountain, I bet you the Matterhorn probably got a thorough looking through, and they were re like just looking and... at everything. Like, did was there something we missed, or you know, whatever? Yeah, I mean, it makes total sense. I that something like Big Thunder is not a brand new, new hire type attraction. It makes yeah. a lot of sense that there's kind of levels, I guess, because you're right, safety concerns and just. How do you do under pressure? Because are you like how many people? I couldn't do it. I could not sit there and look at multiple screens and know if the timing was correct or not correct and know when I needed to hit the like emergency stop button or when it was, you know, all that. Yeah. Even watch watching when you get on Alice, that's arguably a much safer attraction than <laughs> Big Thunder Mountain or any of the big like roller coasters. But I've even watched that, you know, the kind of the stress that you can you as a cast member can feel trying to, again, with the timing and making sure everything's doing what they need to do. You got to make sure people get in, get out, all that fun stuff and doing so safely without kind of having a domino effect of all the the little caterpillars there. (laughs) And that's exact. It's interesting that you bring up the Alice attraction because the Alice attraction is one of those that was notoriously dinged by OSHA when there was an OSHA employee coming through the park when they were doing their inspections. They weren't even inspecting Alice, but they walked by and they were like, Hey, up on those leaves and flowers, I don't see any handrails up there. So if there was ever a time that somebody broke down up on those leaves, how do you get them off? And they're like, we help them balance, I guess. (laughs) And so (laughs) now what do you see up there? Nothing but handrails. Well, that and And again, there's checks and balances. Platform. Yeah, the platform. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And so there there really is an insulation of the procedure that allows you to know that disney is as safe a place as you'll ever find and with that the thing that was the most stressful about about big thunder mountain to me is the way that you load trains on there and this this will hopefully help you guys all appreciate a little bit more the the cast members who are working about an hour and a half after the park opens because they have the most stressful situation. So oh. as as you know, Big Thunder Mountain has trains that come on both sides of the station, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Well, in the morning, they only come in on one side of the station because there's not oh. enough guest demand. They only come in, they get loaded in on one side of that station. And so you're loading people up. You have about 40 seconds to get them in that train and then you launch them off. And then the second train comes in and you have another 40 seconds to load them in and then you launch them off and then you wait about a minute and a half until both of those trains come back around, you unload them, so on and so forth. Well, when that third train comes on, that padding of time goes from about 40 seconds to 14 seconds. You have to dispatch a train every 14 seconds, roughly. And so that means that you have to ensure that every guest is sitting sitting every guest has their lap bar down and has ensured that it is in the locked position and then you dispatch it and so doing that that quickly is still to this day one of those things where i i count it as one of the most stressful situations because if you don't launch that train within like 23 seconds 
the whole ride shuts down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It breaks yeah. down. Then you have to evacuate everybody and then do the, the two to three hour process of resetting every single zone on yeah. that thing. So then so at, at that point, once you have three trains, is it the fourth train when they open the other side? Yep. And then it yep. becomes so, easier. So you'll again. hear this. But exactly. Then, yeah, but then you're but you're having to like feed it in in between as the other ones are coming. This is giving me like stress levels, just like yeah, thinking about yeah. this. The anxiety induction that happens with this is insane. So, wow. and you can even like, you can hear the cast members communicating with one another. You'll hear them say one train, one side. And then a few minutes later, you'll hear them say two trains, one side. And then you'll hear them say three trains, one side. And the most of the time when you hear that, the cast members, especially in that group position are like, Okay, okay. They start like hyperventilating and getting ready for what they're about to experience. But then it goes four trains, two sides. And then you've got five trains, two sides, six trains, two sides. And when you're up to that, then then that sucker's cooking. And you really don't have as much to worry about because everything's as it should be. So then once you get past the three trains, one side, and you're 14 seconds of uh, peril, get, uh, get on, get off, get on, get off. Come on, people, let's go. When it's fully loaded, once you've opened that other side, what what is the the time? What does the time go for loading then? Oh gosh, it goes back up to a very normal pace, like a cush. So it's like forty seconds yeah. or whatever. Yeah, it it's it's definitely a lot more comfortable than when you're three trains one side. Like I said, I I my wife will wake me up in the middle of the night and be like, "Honey, you were doing it again. You were saying three trains one side in your sleep." <laughs> like, it it was. It was the epitome of stress. And this so is... I I always tried to avoid that shift because I <laughs> never loved that level of stress at Disneyland. I was like, these two things don't belong to each other. Stress and right. Disney, not my bag. You've made me realize that I don't think I've ever gone to Big Thunder that early to see only one side going, nor have I ever felt rushed getting on and off the train. So I definitely have not experienced no. Three chains, one side in the 14 seconds. But man. well, if you want to if you want to get on Thunder fast, there's a reason why there's only like a 10 minute wait usually in the morning. And it's because they are just booking, <laughs> yeah. getting those people on the yeah. attraction and getting them out. Dang. And so if you're looking for a quick express train, that's the time to do it is <laughs> usually if the park opens at eight, get there around like 845. So so you're yeah. you're getting me to think about all this now. So I have I have more operational questions. I don't know if our listeners Absolutely. are here for this, but I'm totally here for this. So I'm here for you. So Terry. in the morning, okay, you start with you let let's I don't know. You can maybe walk us through this after I get through the question. But like you start with like one train, and then you had a second train, you had the third train. People are panicking. You had the fourth train, whatever. I, I I've seen it happen frequently. If you could kind of explain this, maybe of. You know, is is that determined by you look at the queue and if the, like the queue is not very long, then it's like, OK, let's take one of the trains off because I've seen them take trains off before and they just they don't put them back in the parking area. They just kind of have them on that junction track kind of hanging out there by Rancho. Yes. Just like, yeah. Waiting because the they, they know that it's going to pick up again. But right now they don't need as many trains or whatever. And then, and then, and then what's the, this is just all together. Uh, so you can go on about this, but and then what's the wind down at the end of the night? Do you do the same thing? Does it end up with three trains, one side at like, if it's yep. open till midnight at like 11? Cause like there's like not 10, as many people. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, I mean, when I was working at the park, we were like height of the recession. So we were stoked if there was a 10 minute wait on Thunder Mountain. Oh, we were like, yeah, people actually want to ride. Oh, those were the days, y'all. Those <laughs> were the days. But you're absolutely right. The way that it works, it ramps up and ramps down the exact same way. So you'll start pulling trains. Usually nowadays, you're not going to see a lot of trains being put back into storage during regular operating hours. They're going to be at full capacity because Thunder always has 40, 50, 60 mm-hmm. minute waits now. Yeah. But if there ever is a time where they start to see a lag. Sometimes you'll see them pull trains off. Usually the park estimates that are put out are designed as such for the leads of that day to kind of estimate exactly how many trains they need in order to hit certain capacity numbers per hour. And that's essentially what it's designed as is you can hit a a point of diminishing returns where you have more people in the park 
than the trains can get on in a reasonable time. So having six trains, actually, actually having four trains is significantly slower than having three trains. And so your capacity, your, your efficiency goes down when you have a lower capacity at four trains than if you had three trains, which is bizarre. It seems like it would be the opposite. Yeah. But again, it's a, it's a strange, delicate dance that you have to do hmm. on an attraction like Thunder in order to satisfy. And, and really, that comes down from the top. Like if if we hear that capacity estimates have changed, that's when they would make that decision and say, OK, we're going to go. We're only going to run four trains today. Usually you don't have a day where they only run three trains because people's hearts can't handle that. <laughs> so when when it is the three trains, uh -huh. are the trains going faster throughout? Is is the ride faster? Is it the same ride pace? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good question. It's always the same speed. It's always the same speed yeah. of the attraction. But gravity, since they're all it? coming in. Yeah, well, when, once it goes up the hills, yeah, gravity is taking it to its next launching point. There are these things, though, throughout the ride that are called LIMS, which stands for a linear induction motor. And essentially, these things are actually kind of awesome the way that they work. So, so think about when you put two magnets together that are of the same pole. What do they mm -hmm. do? They like bounce off of each other and they repel a certain amount of energy. And so essentially what these linear induction motors or these limbs do, and the first one that you'll be able to feel is when you go into the first tunnel, right before you get to the A-lift there, you'll feel that the train picks up speed right there. And what's happening is there's a little, and when you're standing under, under the track, you can watch the train above and you can see these limb mm. fins. It's a little metal fin mm. that's basically just a flat piece of metal and what happens is it's of the same pole as the magnets inside of the box that they run through. Wow. And so whenever it runs through that, those repel one another and create an energy burst that draws that vehicle forward. That's because that's how that's how like yes. the credit coaster works in general, right? Like they have those motors. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And it's it's very common roller coaster design to use these these limb motors and you'll see them throughout the ride. But a lot of times we they they just survive off of a lot of inertia from those hills, because a lot of times that's what a lot of people wonder is, well, what happens if a train gets stuck between lifts oh. and it really never happens? You never have that happen because with those, with the way the system is designed, they're only designed to stop on the lifts or right before the lifts. Mm. Because if they were to stop in the middle, trying to push that train into the next zone where it could actually pick up that inertia or pick up that energy that it needs to move on would be impossible. It would be yeah. extremely difficult. So really what it comes down to also is when you look at, Tony Baxter's job of designing Big Thunder Mountain, it doesn't come down to just, hey, what's what's the best thrill that we're going to have on this attraction? You always have to be thinking through, well, what does an evacuation look like? Yeah. What are the points where our energy drops and dips to where we have to redesign this in order to make it so it hits those certain points that are necessary to get it up that next hill? Hmm. Did that answer your question, Ted? Yeah, all the like all the like physics and everything behind it. Exactly. Exactly. So with that, there's ro roller coasters are remarkably similar yet complexly designed. <laughs> That's wild. That's yeah. absolutely wild. And, and, you know, as you're saying that, I'm like, you know, when you're on Big Thunder or any, you know, any of the roller coaster type attractions, you know, you joke like, oh, it's a good thing. It's, you know, like you kind of there's only certain places that you could evac from. Like, yes, you're whipping through under where the possums are dangling. There are not there's not a like place that I could get out of the train and like walk alongside of it at that point, because exactly the trains just that's interesting. Yeah, because the train just won't stop there. Yep, it won't <laughs> ever stop get there. Stuck there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the only way that you would stop there is if something was obstructing like the track. Yeah. Yeah. And and you you knocked into it. But really, at that point, you'll see that's why there's nothing in that area that can obstruct that track. Yeah. Everything, everything is is reinforced steel 
that it's not going to fall over. There's there's no trees that are going to get in there because sure. they've thoughtfully designed those areas so you can't have that opportunity. That's wild. And you think, you know, we're just we're amazed and amused with the theming that you forget all of the other thought processes that go with attraction design. It's not yeah. just about the story. Like that's yes, that's a layer, that's a part of it, but there's yeah, a whole plethora of other stuff that goes along I, with it. I Go do ahead, have take. a silly story question. Yeah. That it's the I love Big Thunder. It, what's funny is we did have a tr- trip or two where we didn't ride Big Thunder and I'm like, how did we let this happen? Cuz I love Big Thunder. Big Thunder is a, a wonderful attraction and I try to go on it as often as I can. But one part of Big Thunder I don't like, and I'm curious what it's even okay. supposed to be. Okay. So when you go in the first tunnel, uh-huh. and you're in the pitch black, and for some reason Disney wants to burst your eardrums mm-hmm. with... I bu- I'm an old man, and I that? plug my ears in yeah, that section. Every do, single time, I plug my ears. <laughs> what plug is our that? Ears too. <laughs> is that supposed to be like the train horn? So, or realistically, it's an unavoidable problem. Because what you're hitting there is you're getting the energy from that linear induction motor bringing you into that tunnel. And the moment that you're hitting it in there, you're really coming in too fast. It's it's trying to overjudge your, your speed and your energy in that area. And again, remember, weight changes with all of the distribution of guests on the train. And so with the linear induction motors, they're not super intelligent. They can shift their amount of energy based off of certain parameters. But for the most part, that first thing that you're hitting where it goes, what you're hitting is there's a little, it's a little lip that's underneath the train. And that lip kind of pops up over the chain on a lift. And it's only designed to go up but when it comes back down, it locks and it locks in place on that chain. And that's what draws you up the right. the lift. I'm talking so about when before that. I know that part. I'm saying but when you, there's but when the you're coming tunnel, in, yeah, yeah, where it's really loud. What's happening is when you come around that tunnel, it's hitting on that lip or hitting on that tongue underneath the train. And it's causing it to go crack, 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 crack all the way up before it locks into place. And the way the tunnel is, if you had the lights on in there, it's it's just a giant dome. And so <laughs> any sound that you're getting it's in there is bouncing off of everything inside that tunnel. And it is just, it, it's rage inducing to me that like the moment I hear that, I just get anger that I'm like, this is too loud and it shouldn't be. And I'm always like, why are we on this attraction? <laughs> it's like, the yeah. Story wise, like, yeah. oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Story wise, there is no purpose to the sound. There's no reason why that exists from what, a story what's the, like, perspective. Whistle, though? There's like a whistle noise. You go and it's like boop, boop or something like in that first part. So what... <laughs> Big Thunder Mountain, they want you to believe. Disney wants you to believe that there is a thoughtful, cohesive story on Big Thunder Mountain. Sure. But the story that started when the ride opened in the 70s has changed significantly throughout the years. And you'll see this throughout all Disney attractions that have a a hefty story basis. And with Big Thunder, essentially that first, that first entry into the tunnel is you starting to realize that the train is haunted. And I think that that whistle is, is them starting to say, Oh, well, here's where the ghosts are starting to reveal themselves on this Mm. first rise in the rainbow caverns there. Yeah. Either that or just like eeriness of something, something's not quite right with this. Almost like a foreshadowing. Another thing that you might even notice with that is a and C lift are the same tunnel or they, they're the same spire so when you're going up on that first lift people are coming up in the the dynamite tunnel directly oh, next to you on the wall I didn't know that and so what you could also be hearing is when it comes up over that rise and you hear the you could be actually just that could be bleeding over into sure. that a lift tunnel hmm. well look so yeah so many yeah, there's, new things. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's incredible okay, the questions. economy of space on that. What other questions do you guys have? Because honestly, I could just talk for hours. I want to answer <laughs> your guys' questions instead of just being like, and then, and then, and then. Yeah. My my next one that I think kind of 
that I had written down that just happens to go with the track, no pun intended, that uh-huh. we were just on, <laughs> was I want to pick your brain and I want to talk to you about the history and the story of the attraction. Because yes. if anyone's listened to the Backside of Water podcast, you know that they do wonderful deep dives on these things. And so I feel like you have a wealth of knowledge being someone that worked on the attraction and then also someone that's just a big history nerd and attraction nerd. So yes. please talk to us about the story because I think everyone knows kind of like the the ba- maybe just like the top layer of yeah. what the story is. Yeah, well, and I don't know if you guys go this deep nerd, but they actually have a comic series based oh. off of the quote unquote official now Disney story really? of Big Thunder Mountain. And yeah, it's it actually... It plays a lot off of both Disneyland and mostly Disney World at the Magic Kingdom, but it follows the devious Barnabas T. Bullion, which have you guys talked about Barnabas Bullion on your show before? I feel like he may have been a trivia question, but that may have been the extent of it. (laughs) Okay. So it's a great trivia question, and it plays into the Society of Explorers and Adventurers, which is something that's in our wheelhouse as well. But Barnabas T. Bullion, the the more official story now is that Barnabas T. Bullion wanted to essentially buy the town of Rainbow Ridge because he knew that there was gold up in the Mdar Hills. (laughs) And he wanted to essentially strip mine all of it, just pull out all the gold he could potentially pull out. And keep in mind, this is the story that I was told during my training because they give you the story of the attraction when you're going through your training. That's neat. You know, that you need in that 40 seconds of throwing people into the thing. And then yeah. exactly. Everybody sit down. Let me tell you the story real quick. Okay. I'm going to go. Sorry. Um, well, part two will be next. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I just, I just tell them as they come in and that's the story of big thunder mountain. <laughs> <laughs> that's clever. <laughs> so with that, when, when they started sending trains up into the mine, they didn't realize that this was native burial ground that they were mining on. And essentially Barnabas T. Bullion and his cronies all defiled the land. Therefore the trains became haunted by, by the spirits of that native burial ground and started running amok. And that's essentially the story behind why the trains exist the way they do from a story perspective from Disney. And if you read the Marvel comic about Big Thunder Mountain, you'll get more detail about Barnabas T. Bullion. The thing that's cool about Barnabas T. Bullion is you can actually see a photo of him hanging down in the Magic Kingdom way more prominently. But in Disneyland, if you take a look while you're riding past Rainbow Ridge, which is the little town there where you hear like the piano playing and you hear all the bar fights and all that fun stuff, which it really is worth just standing in that area and listening as much as you can because the the dialogue in that area is hilarious. Okay, it now is, where do we have to stand to be able to experience this? You, you queue, need probably. to be, yeah, you need to be in a really, really long queue. Gotcha. And a really slow noticed. moving queue. Yeah. We've because definitely there's... been in long, slow moving queues at Big Thunder. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, back in the day during Fast Pass, when that Fast Pass line would back up, you would have a long time to be able to listen to all of the different conversations being had in Rainbow Ridge. But in that Rainbow Ridge area, when you're riding by super quick, in one of the buildings there, I believe that it's the, the last building or the second to last building. You can look in super fast and you see a picture of Barnabas T. Bullion on the wall in Rainbow Ridge. And he looks remarkably exactly like Tony Baxter. <laughs> Shocker. I wonder. There's no yeah. way there was any sort of intent there. <laughs> Reference in the there, Behind right? the Attraction episode, they had an interview with Tony Baxter and it wasn't his idea to put himself in this thing. So he was like, I don't know. They say it looks like me. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, it's totally you. <laughs> well, and that's, that's the coy way that the Imagineers it's, that's all an act that the Tony Baxter and that whole crew, the society of explorers and adventures all started out as a gag. It was, it was an in joke amongst all Imagineers. Mm-hmm. There was never really any intention for this to grow out into this large lore. Yeah. It was it was just Joe Lanzicero and the rest of the Imagineers all being like, 
this is really funny to to have these little in jokes that when yeah. we go together, we see that Tony is this this greedy, scummy gold baron, which is hilarious because Tony Baxter's personality is the exact opposite yeah. of yeah. that. <laughs> and so so that's what I think is really funny about those things is that they they all in their their kind of Imagineers club. They all play it off as though oh, we don't know what they're talking about, but they're all in on the <laughs> gag. Sure. That's awesome. So wow. so with that, that's that's the official story. Now, I mean, the the story itself with Big Thunder Mountain, the thing that's cool about the history is that whole area is absolutely chock full of Disney history. I mean, when you when you take it all the way yeah. back to the pack mules that yeah. were being ridden in that area at the very opening of Disneyland back in 55, then you see that evolve into Mind Train through Nature's Wonderland, which have you guys seen the Mickey Mouse short on the Mind Train through Nature's Wonderland? No. Oh, I haven't. Oh, we just so we were at Walt's Barn in December and there somebody, I don't know, I was too enamored with the the model that I didn't really pay that close of attention, but they had a model of what where the the mules were and where the rainbow the whole, area. The, the whole thing yeah rainbow what it Ridge, uh-huh. like which was great because I have always known kind of sort of like everyone knows the tunnels that's another like Disney secret Disneyland yes. secret that's not a secret anymore yeah. everyone knows about that but I we couldn't picture like the full layout of how that so that was we spent way too much time <laughs> looking at this well, little model of it. And it was just fascinating. So we got to it's check out the Mickey Mouse, the Mickey Mouse episode or the Mickey so Mouse it, episode. Yeah. And because what you'll see is everything in that episode is a reference. It's everything is a reference and a tribute to the, the mind train and wow. to big Thunder Mountain. It's, it's one of the best Mickey Mouse shorts of, of that bunch, which I mean, honestly, every single one of those is a knockout and that's coming from somebody who's not a huge Disney movie or animated television series fan. Like I, that's, that's not my brand of Disney. I'm parks and history guy. So when I say that the, the short is good, I think it's accessible is for it, most oh, people. Is, oh, okay. So this is like the new. Mickey yes. Mouse the two from 2013 and beyond when they, it, when they did that revamp, is it nature's wonderland? Does that sound that's like the it? one? Okay. Yes, that's the one. And it is, fantastic season well, um, four yeah. episode eight if anyone's curious <laughs> Boom. i am on disney plus right now trying to find this so yes i was curious yeah it is season four awesome episode. because what what it does first is it takes you it, it, it essentially rewinds you back to what you used to see and a lot of people will say that the birth of animatronics came from the enchanted tiki room which is technically true but really walt disney started creating or playing with robotics oh, yeah. on mine train. And when you have when you have the rolling rock and when you have the bears that are coming out, that's where you see this proto animatronic starting to appear in the parks. And it yeah, wasn't they were an, more advanced than like the junk because the jungle crews had some, but they were not as it was an up yeah. and down. It was a yep, grrr, yep, go up, yep. grrr, go back yep, down. They were, so yes. those were the first ones, but they weren't yeah, as advanced. So it's it's interesting to kind of see the the progression. And look at that. Yeah. It all happened in the same corner of the park. <laughs> exactly. It, there's a reason why I could spend all of my time at Disneyland on the west side. Yeah. <laughs> as we used to say, west side, best side. Mm-hmm. But that's that's a little elitist. <laughs> but with that, one of the things that I think is super cool, and I don't know if if a lot of people really intellectualize this. But when you are going in that first tunnel after the loud clack clacks, as you're rising, you're seeing these, it's called rainbow caverns in there. And you're seeing the rainbow pools as the water's dripping and it's creating this rainbow effect in the water. And that's a direct reference back to the rainbow caverns in the mine train through nature's wonderland. It was an area where you would go and it was essentially all like black light technology when you'd go through this tunnel and all these fountains and all these pools would be lit up and super illuminated. And it was one of the like big selling points of the mine train. And as a result, they decided to keep that in the ride in order to pay tribute yeah. to the original attraction. And then there's a bunch of other tributes and nods to the original throughout that thing. That's what I love about Tony Baxter is Tony Baxter is 
is such a he is such a preserver of Disney history in everything that he does yeah. that you can just trust anything that came from that guy's hands because all he wanted to do was was uphold the original magic yeah. that happened at that park. Yeah. It's 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 wild it really is. And the thing that's so cool about it too is that that first room, that tribute and how that was such a big draw, I guess cuz when I think of what the attraction posters were for Mine Train, it was like the the Rainbow Caverns. Yeah, it was the caverns. And I think it's fun cuz every time I'm on that attraction, you for I don't know what it is, but you just it's not like it's the most fancy, most flashy part of any of the attractions in any Disney parks, but there's something about it that just kind of draws your eyes. I watch even like kids and whatever. They're all kind of like, oh, what's that down there? It's just, it's cool. I think it's a really nice nod. And one thing that I think is fascinating from an operational perspective is it basically shakes its left hand so you don't watch what the right hand's yeah. doing. Because yeah. when you look on the right side, that's where your evacuation stairs are. There's yeah. nothing really there yeah. to oh. see. And so so they point your eye in a specific direction. So mm -hmm. you focus on that and not on the operational pieces of the attraction. Which, again, it's those little things that I'm like, that is brilliant engineering. Yeah. And that's brilliant storytelling. Well, and the fact that it works on people that have written it. Hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. <laughs> never yep. have I thought to like, now I'm going to because you've said, like, because right. you've pointed it out, but never have I just had the desire to look to the right while we're in the caverns. <laughs> exactly. And that's one thing that I think is a cool challenge for people who may be like, I've been to Disneyland a hundred times. Look the opposite direction yeah. <laughs> than what you're supposed to be looking yeah. at. Oh, yeah. And, and that's where some of the coolest stuff comes from when you're a Disney nerd that and looking up always so, look up one thing mm. that we were told by a supporter and someone that was on the podcast Chrysanthi she is a musician and so her thing which we were playing we were playing this game for a while is try and find the speakers when you're in attraction Ooh. where is the speaker because they're usually hidden so, I mean once you find like Try to pay attention to where the sound's coming from and look. You can usually spot it, but it's amazing how well they just blend in and you don't yeah. even... you. Do, it's, again, one of those things that you... The ooh, you're like, oh, yeah, clearly there's speakers in these attractions, but you don't ever think... Yeah, there's, you know, obviously it's there, but you don't think about it, so... Yeah. And it's go. incredible to think that there's somebody who built an entire career mm -hmm. based off of hiding speakers. I mean, yeah. that's what the and, sound department yeah, does. Putting them in the right spot so that they do what they need. Yeah, it's incredible. sonically it hits the way that it should. Yeah, I yeah. think I think my tangentially related to this. I think that my second favorite group of people at Disney are the light lighting designers because oh, yes. I love how they like light things. I do have to say that I think my number one favorite department has to be horticulture because they do an amazing oh, job it's around the park. Incredible, but. Alex, you brought it up, and I have to ask since you since you opened the door. Tell us. Yes, about... I'm shorter than I look. I'm almost. <laughs> I'm I'm a little under five seven. Yes, thanks for bringing it up, Tay. <laughs> Let's talk about because I'm I'm an operations guy. I always want to know yes. how all the things work. Tell us about Big Thunder evacuations because we've Ooh. never been lucky enough. <laughs> Teresa and I Air are those quotes weirdos. There for those of you that can't see, <laughs> Teresa and I are those weirdos who. We yearn for being walked off of attractions, yep. and it doesn't happen to us nearly enough. What, ever. I've here, never here. been walked off an attraction. Actually, that's a lie. I don't think I've talked about this on the podcast. I was I had an in-show exit. However, it was the parking lot tram, so we're not counting that. <laughs> it didn't even leave the station, but we had to evacuate and get off the parking lot tram. <laughs> that's the most that's underwhelming, it. isn't it? That yep. you're like, oh, and this is what I get for wishing. I yeah, I did get the cool one. I did somehow get walked off of the Matterhorn, and we got to ride in the terrifyingly small, <laughs> creaky, I don't know if this is actually OSHA-approved elevator. Ooh. Yeah. That is rare. I, yes. I will say, I don't know how a, a Matterhorn evac works, but... Yeah. I I don't imagine that it's common for people to be using mechanical elevators during an evac. So I think that you got a special treatment there. We were we were so you got to the top and like I went around like the first curve and it stopped. And they have 
said the most annoying thing is they say the same spiel like a hundred times. Over and we're over. coming for you. Don't get out of your car. Please say stated. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. we're coming. Someone will be with you. Don't move. Over and over. It's like those, uh, your call is very important to us. <laughs> and so they, they took us out and there's really, I mean, you're not going to walk the entire track to the bottom. So we walked in this like little, you know, Disney's good at hiding corners yeah. and whatnot. And I was joking that I was like, oh, I heard there's like a basketball court here. And the the cast member said, if I didn't have to take a bunch of people off the off of the attraction right now, I would show it to you. But I've got to go back because I got to whatever. So we get there's like five of us in this tiny little elevator and it just goes to the bottom. And where it comes out, I didn't even know was there was a path or a gate there. (laughs) And I see it now when I go by because I know it's there. But there's a little path over by it kind of faces the the bathrooms, the the, the Alice bathrooms. bathrooms. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a gate there and it just blends into the rest of the fence and you don't even really notice it, but that goes to the elevator. And just walks right out. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm curious. Yeah, because every every attraction's different. I also think that in show exit is a term that we never used at Disney. That's the, the crazy thing. <laughs> You're like, so, where did this come from? <laughs> it's such a fancy term, in-show yeah. exit. Yeah. I what think did you that call it? Was it? Probably, oh, an, an evacuation. It oh. was just, like, like I said earlier, I just said it's an evac. Yeah. Uh, and, and who knows? Maybe that's like a dark ride term. I would imagine that maybe, that's probably more maybe. of a dark ride term. My it does, kids, it sounds more. It sounds more Disney to be an in-show exit versus an evacuation because evac. that just yeah, sounds very exactly. It's very technical, very yeah. clinical. But my kids love TPM vids on YouTube, and they watch the top twenty-five best in-show exits. <laughs> and I'm the same way that I always want something to break down because I always want to see how that sausage is made. Mm-hmm. And we so this last time when we went in January, it was my first in show exit, <gasps> wow. and it 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 was extremely underwhelming because we broke down on Buzz Lightyear's Astro Blasters <laughs> in the first room. We didn't even make it to the first Zerg. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, but it was pretty awesome because the second the the ride breaks down. You know it because all these crazy hidden handrails just automatically, <laughs> automatically pop up, and you're like. Ooh, I didn't know that was there. <laughs> and so, yeah, it is. There is something very fascinating about how a ride is evacuated. And Big Thunder Mountain is no exception to that rule. I will tell you guys, one of my best Disney memories is an evac on Big Thunder Mountain. Mm-hmm. So the way that Big Thunder Mountain is designed is like we talked about earlier. All of the trains will be evacuated from a lift zone, whether it's A, B, or C lift. Or it's going to be towards like that, towards the the station itself. But in those areas, when those trains essentially stop, you have to weave your way back in a very specific path that you're trained over and over to follow to get to either A, B, or C lift. And you go out, you're very methodical in the way that you you evacuate the train. You always go to the top of the train and evacuate at the top first and then have everybody stand out on the stairs as you evacuate the next car, next car, so on and so forth. And then everybody follows the leader all the way out of the attraction. And you usually walk through the belly of A and C lift there. So you see all of the inner workings of the electronics and the mechanical side of how the mountain runs when you evacuate. Then you pop out basically where the circle spire is there, where you take the big 360 ride. And then you pass down over and walk out through the exit right there. Hmm. And it's, it's kind of a fascinating path. And sometimes you'll walk them up through Rainbow Ridge and walk them out the exit in that direction as well. So there's, there's depending on where you're at, you'll always get a longer journey. I will say the only lift that doesn't give you a really cool exploration is the first lift. A lift, mm-hmm. you basically just walk out through that, that electronics tunnel, and then you're off the ride. So that oh, one's sure. not as thrilling. But if you get B or C, C will allow you to, but believe it or not, when you get evacuated from C lift, 
you actually walk through a lift and go back down that same tunnel. So B lift is the ideal if you ever get stuck. And that's where my best story comes from. So is B that, lift is that where is, like is that at the, the goat? top is that where the that's goat the rattlers. Is? Yep. Right oh, before yeah. the goat. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So when you're going up, you see the rattlers on the side mm-hmm. and then you see the bull castrator on the right side of the train. And then you're, you're stuck on that part. And so in that area, it's, you could, if you were standing there, you could spit on the castle from where you're at. And you <laughs> never realize that. Like, you don't realize spatially that you are probably 20 yards from the from the, the roof of the castle right there. Wow. And yeah. so with that, we had a train breakdown at about 9.48 p.m., which fireworks start at 9.25 <laughs> so fireworks were going off as this train broke down and we were evacuating people off of B lift while the fireworks were going off on the castle 20 <laughs> yards from us, just giant, massive yeah. white explosions all over the place. It was the most magical, unforgettable <laughs> experience I and all of the people on the train yeah. have ever had in that park it was just absolutely the best evac you could ever have that's pretty i mean people get excited to ride big thunder during the fireworks yeah to be evac during the fireworks it's just like ultimate it, yep <laughs> yep it was the cherry on top without a doubt oh one, that was my of favorite the things that i find amazing about big thunder and i didn't this was probably the last couple years i realized this that if you're walking along Big Thunder Trail there by, mm-hmm. you know, it's one of the entrances to Galaxy's Edge now, the the attraction is, like, right there. Like, mm-hmm. you don't really yeah. notice that it's right there. It, it's that same, it's the other side of the drop hill stuff, that same, whatever. Yeah, because you can, you can, if yeah. you're standing in the right spot on that path, you can see the goat from, yeah. from there. Which is just but it's just amazing because when you're on the attraction, you don't realize that there's a path with <laughs> guests like right there. Yeah. You don't even yep. like you're Disney is so good at this. Mm-hmm. Well, and because w- when you're when you're passing back through to Fantasyland there, mm-hmm. and you get the backside of of Big Thunder Mountain, which is another podcast that I host. I can't get away. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, on the backside of Big Thunder Mountain there. There's a little circular berm area of a wall, essentially, that just looks like giant Bryce Canyon rocks. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the circle where you come around, go under the possums and drop down into the coyotes. So that kind of puts it into perspective where all of that is kind of bunched up together all in a tiny spot. And with that back there, there's a bunch of mining equipment i don't know if you guys have ever noticed that that they've it, it's old uh, like mine cars and there's like this funny looking like steam engine on a mine cart itself back there fun fact those were actually all used in the hit disney film the apple dumpling gang oh, oh. so now is a that movie are you talking when you're on the attraction you see these or when no you're when you're walking that, like, on the back side gotcha. yes yep, okay yep, yes yep yep you're gonna I know see exactly a, the spot. That's where I can, that's where we spotted that like, you can see the goat from there. Yes, yes. <laughs> Over in that section right there. Got it, got is, it. Is is where they have the apple dump, dumpling gang stuff, which is funny because people are like, What is the apple dumpling mm-hmm. gang? But but when we were training, that was like the big thing that they're like, Oh, that's that's some apple dumpling gang stuff. And throughout the entire this is actually a cool thing, and I don't know that this this might be one of those where TikTok has ruined all of this. But one thing that I think is super awesome about Big Thunder, and it's a detail that not a lot of people really pay attention to or appreciate, but when you are walking through the queue area there and all the boulders are lined up, if you take the time to notice, you'll see that all of the rocks have gold flecks infused into those those boulders right there that hold up that berm area. Because it's designed essentially to sparkle in the sunlight to make you realize that there's gold over all of the Big Thunder area there. Yeah. And I think that's a super cool touch. And you said that's in the queue, huh? Yes. So right after you get through the the height check there and mm-hmm. you walk down that first oh, time yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that first path and then take an immediate right, 
all those rocks that are surrounding that entire area all are flecked with gold. So when the sunlight hits it, it sparkles all Dang. the way through that area. I've never noticed that. I need to pay attention very cool. to this. It's very cool. I've never cool. noticed that, nor do I think I've heard that on any sort of, like, I don't think that's a fun fact that anyone shared online that I've seen. So look at that. You've you heard, heard it here on DL people. Weekly. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to... I'm going to have like a, I should be making a list of all the things. Okay. Next time we're there, we're going to spend like, we have multiple park days finally for our next upcoming trip. Yes. And so we'll have plenty of time to just like, Im- not embrace, but just really. Just so close things just soak up. Soak it all in. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Big Thunder, it's one of those where the the star of the show kind of takes away from the supporting characters with Big Thunder, that you're really thinking about the thrill of the attraction on that. And we don't really take a lot of time to appreciate all the little details. I mean, for instance, just watch all the flashing lights inside of the, the group station there. And you'll know exactly when a train is coming. You'll know exactly when a train needs to dispatch. When that light turns solid, you better get that train out. Otherwise, something bad is going to happen soon and that that ride's going to break down. There's just all these little single details. All of the the mining equipment that is inside of the queue area was all used Mm -hmm. during the gold rush of the late 1800s in California. So all of that is is authentic antique mining equipment which is just a, a great little touch yeah. in my opinion. Mm-hmm. You you mentioned the lights and this is not directly again this is triggered a memory of how clever Disney is with certain things. So I uh-huh. remember and and they stopped doing this. I don't know if like it broke or what. But I distinctly remember riding Splash Mountain at night. And the load area had the lanterns on either side of the the log that you're going to get into. And right before they would dispatch, the lanterns would light up really bright so the so the cast member could like see everything clearly, and then it would go back to being dim. And I remember thinking, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Because you don't yep. want it bright all the time because you mm-hmm. lose the ambiance, but you still need to be safe. Exactly. And, and I thought that that was brilliant. So you're talking about that. And, and the same thing happens, I think, on pirates that they have like a lantern that's that's like red and it'll turn green mm-hmm. or whatever when it's like ready to go but it just looks like a lantern but exactly it, they've disguised all these things and i just i just find that they find such creative ways oh, yeah. to still do the things that they have to do to make it a uh, operating modern attraction but make it look like it's not an attraction <laughs> and that's what separates an amusement park from a theme park mm-hmm. is exactly yeah. what you're talking about and that's what i think is so great about how disney does what it does yeah and and i will say i think that the heyday of the hidden in plain sight was the baxter era because he yeah. was so meticulously obsessed with those types of things. When you see the dispatch area for something like Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, it's got some great theming throughout, but they could have really done some awesome things with those dispatch stations, but they just didn't. It was yeah. kind yeah. of a missed theming opportunity in those areas. Same thing with with Roger Rabbit. When you see Cartoon Spin, you're like, okay, that's just a dispatch podium. Yeah, I I, I want to see more Inc. than that. Monsters Inc. is another one I can think of too, where it's like very exactly. obvious. <laughs> yep. yep, what that and, is, and that's the interesting thing is notice how you never see a button on Big Thunder Mountain. That's true. You never see one button on the console, and it is and, very thoughtfully designed that way for you not to see how. How do you dispatch how... it then? What does the console look like? No, no, so, no, like you, the guest. Yeah, the guest oh. never the guest sees the console. So it's Whereas, not like you know how sometimes you get curious tag that we're waiting there like on like and I stare at Monsters it, yeah. Inc and you kind of like do up <laughs> where yep. you're kind of looking around trying to see it because it's just it's interesting but yeah you you can't do that at Big Thunder where you know my my favorite one is Toy Story Midway Mania that one because they have the at. monitor like right there but they have one of those privacy shields but it's too small for the big monitor so it's just covering like <laughs> part of it I'm like what's even the point. They're trying. They're trying. Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. One thing that I think is, well, and one thing that you'll, you'll find maybe fascinating is every single time you see somebody at one of those consoles, notice where their right hand is. 
Their right yeah. hand will always be on a single button. Yep. And it's all, it, it can never leave that that button. And I'm always I even fascinated. see that like on like on Alice, like James yeah. or like Teresa yeah. was talking about earlier. Is yeah. when they're loading you, their hand is on that. Mm-hmm. Until you go, and then like, and then like they push it or pull it. Like I don't know. There's a whole thing that they do, and then they have to hit the go button. And then they sit there and they mash the go button like a hundred times. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so that's one thing that I love is just just playing e stop bingo. Like whenever I walk <laughs> through the park, seeing how many people I can see with their their hand on the e stop at all times. Yeah. But that's one thing that I love about Thunder is. The magic is never broken mm-hmm. because of the way the consoles exist. And I mean, honestly, the vast majority of people don't even realize that when you're getting grouped, there's probably three or four cast members hanging out up in that top area in the tower operating the entire ride. But you never see it. You never notice it because it's hidden up behind a giant wall. And that's that's the extra magic touch that a ride built in the seventies has that a modern Disney attraction doesn't have that much anymore, unfortunately. So yeah, cause that's space mountain too. They got the people yep. up in the little like dispatch pod mm-hmm. thing. Yes. Yes. And which I think is fascinating because I love how those people can interact with you too. You can wave at them yeah. and they'll wave yeah. back at you. I think that's great extra Disney magic I was without to, a doubt. I was trying to think cause usually, cause yeah, I was thinking space in credit coaster is another one where they're, you know, kind of up. But yes, the Matterhorn, no. I think the Matterhorn, they've got a console thing right before you're going to go into the mountain. But I think there's also one behind you, like when you're loaded, yeah. it's kind of like above. I think their the tower is in the ticket booth there, like that yeah. big ticketing yeah, yeah, yeah. office that you see right there. I think that's where their tower the is, area, yeah. is hidden. And it's fascinating to me, Tag, that you had that experience on Matterhorn because I've always been curious where the evac points are on yeah. Matterhorn because essentially it's just a you're constantly going like you just yeah. you're riding all you the, the way down. You go, if yeah. you, I notice it now because of being evac'd off of it. But if you next time you you ride it, literally just look at the walls because it's just like Sp- Splash Mountain was kind of like this too, where if you look kind of next to you but a little behind you you'll see that the the paths all kind of go off at an angle so if you're going through normally you don't really see it but if you kind of look behind you you notice that the way it's angled that there's a hallway there that you kind of exit through i need to like keep, splash keep was an like eye out that because if you which is probably gonna be different now but previously when splash was splash mountain when you got to the bottom of that lift hill if you look to your right there was usually a cast member there, like mm. watching you. Yes, and sometimes they were more visible than others. There was one time I remember in particular, the guy was literally leaning back in the chair, so on four legs, like two of the legs <laughs> were up in the air, and he's just like chilling there. And I'm just like, uh, well, okay. I mean, I guess it's a boring job, I suppose, if nobody's acting up. But yeah, so so they're just these little kind of hidden things, so little cubbies. Here and I there. assume that that's how it is on Big Thunder too, because like I didn't There's know no... that there was any of these like places where people could walk into different areas. Yeah, well, the thing that's nice about Big Thunder is we have a lot of darkness to cover those areas, and we have a lot of natural path. That, that I was gonna say it looks like it just looks like it's a like a I don't know animal trail or something. Exactly, it looks like a pack mule trail, mm-hmm. and so like right at the base of B lift there, where there is the hidden Mickey cogs. Oh yeah, right there where you pass over the train. That's where you take that evac trail, and you'll just next time you guys are on there, you'll see that it's very clear that that's the path that you take right by that Circle Spire Mountain and go around and go through to get them out into the exit. It's fascinating. But speaking of lighting, one of the things that I think is awesome about Big Thunder Mountain is back in the day, you have certain perks as a cast member. And one of the perks is when the park closes, if you've got a good manager and a good lead, (laughs) they will put you in the 15th row with all show lights off on Big Thunder Mountain. So you ride through Big Thunder Mountain in pitch black darkness the entire show and it's awesome but it's also horrifyingly (laughs) scary (laughs) there's 
You still I think have all the, the noises, right? Just none of the lights. Yeah, you get all the show sounds. You just don't have any of the lights on. So you have the coyotes howling. <laughs> you have the goat. You have all those things, but it's just in darkness. Oh, that's got to be weird. It's, I, I will say this. I, I'm a wimp. And uh, at the end of every day, two cast members have to walk the track. One starts by going forward and the other one starts going back. And you have to meet in the middle and walk back together. And there are very few things as genuinely terrifying as walking through some of those canyon areas of Big Thunder Mountain because they don't have show lights on at that point. And you were walking back there in just pitch darkness. And there are a thousand ghost stories about Big Thunder Mountain. And all you can think about that entire time walking the track is that a haunt is right around the corner, <laughs> getting ready to take over your soul as you walk around. Why Why do you have to walk the track if it's so dark that you can't like see anything, really? <laughs> You know, that's a great question. I think it's a hazing technique. <laughs> no. Um, really, what it comes down to is cell phones, hats, glasses. I mean, a lot of people don't people take that the minor. People hang on and hang on exactly. to stuff. When they, they, they did not heed that old minor no. and realize that it was the wildest ride in the wilderness, it's our <laughs> job to go at the end of the day. We go and collect all those things. The other things that cast members are looking for is like obstructions that could potentially cause hazards. Sure. All those different end of the day things that happen. I mean, granted, we then have to do the exact same thing at seven o'clock in the morning when we get there the next day as well. But it's one of those That's that primarily it's 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 a collection run, which I don't know if I ever found anything cool on those. <laughs> Now that I think about it, I never found a cell phone. Y'all, I worked there before smartphones were ubiquitous. So mm. that that wasn't a big thing. Mostly it was hats. We picked up a lot of hats off of Big Thunder Mountain. But I, I really did love it because it's cool being able to walk. I, I think that's everybody's dream at Disney is to be able to walk the track of your favorite ride because it's just a different experience. Well, you get to take what, in all the details so much exactly. easier. Uh, unless you're scared of ghosts and yes. then you don't take it in any details. You <laughs> That's just, why you work in the morning and you get your heart rate up with the three tracks in one side, but you get to walk the track when it's light out. It, yeah, uh, so, it's give and take. It's I was give and take. Say, so your ideal shift was like the mid shift. I want nothing to do with the morning. I want nothing to do with the, the closing. <laughs> Solid I midday will say shift. <laughs> that if, if it came down to it, I always wanted a jungle shift. But when it came down to it, if I had to choose between open and close, I would do close every time. There is something just absolutely magical. I, th I This is my opinion. I think some, I know that there's a lot of people who disagree. I don't think that there's any place that is more beautiful at night mm -hmm. than Frontierland. I think that oh. the, lighting the lighting on the, gorgeous. on the big Thunder Mountain spires mm -hmm. is breathtaking. Yeah. And so being able to walk around, especially on like a, a midsummer night where it's in like the, the, the high 70s, low 80s, you're walking around just in the silence of Disneyland with all knowing that there's a bunch of activity around you. But the path that you're walking, you are uniquely alone. That is a very, very rare instance at Disneyland when you are uniquely alone in a space. But when you are and you're walking through there, it really makes you realize how Disneyland is so gargantuanly huge compared <laughs> to what we're used to. When it's just you and that track, you realize, wow, I feel like I am out in the middle of the deserted desert right now. Yeah, that's wild. We had so much fun talking with Alex about his experience at Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and there's so much more to come, some really exciting, interesting stuff. And of course, we are just thrilled to hear about it, especially myself. I love talking about Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, but we'll have to wait till next week when we get the second half of his interview. Looks like we're coming in for a landing, gang. But please stay listening until trivia comes to a stop. The menus can walk to the nearest exit. Thanks for listening to the eighth wonder of the world, Dio Weekly. Well, welcome back to Trivia Land. I'm glad we had a, a Big Thunder-related question based on our guest this week, right? <laughs> That's true. Happy accident. I mean, Big Thunder is so wonderful. So I got four questions, all mine. We'll see how you did this week. And listeners at home, 
We'll see if you did a little better. I'm feeling pretty all right with this. This wasn't as scary as as you were leading on that it may be, James. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll My find first out. question for you to see if we're going to keep feeling good was what 3D film was the first to play at the Magic Eye Theater in Tomorrowland? You both said Captain EO, which means you forgot about Magic Journeys. Oh. Oh, Magic Journeys. Ah. Uh. Okay. Not feeling as good anymore. <laughs> no. I get it. Like, Captain EO was the big deal, but swing and a miss. All right, moving on. Second question, a throwback question to episode 217. I wanted to know if you could remind me what national park inspired Big Thunder Mountain. And you are right. It is Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. <laughs> Woo! Good All job, Teresa. Part of the answer. Well done. Our third question was an audio clue. I gave you a little 10 second snippet from an attraction, and you both. Took the right journey down the rabbit hole. Alice in Wonderland was our question. Woohoo! That's that was sorry, Chase, but that was an easy one. I I know. Shh, shh. He's Sometimes being nice, these okay? audio ones are very difficult. I was just saying this time was not too bad. It's it's hard to find a really good challenging audio one. So I kind of like that they're they're pretty mood setting for you. Now I did I did I think I stumped you on a Grizzly River Run at one point. Yes, that was see, and sometimes. Not that I should tell you this, but if they're like two, two to three seconds, that's also. Oh, yeah. That's know? definitely going to be tough. You know, I'm just thinking for the future, when next time we don't have a discussion topic, we should do like an audio challenge where we all bring Ooh. clips and we play it for each other and see how many people, like I'll play a clip and then you and James and Vern have to guess and see how many people. And then you play a clip and me and James and Vern have to guess and then James plays a clip. Like we could do a thing like that. That would be fun for the listeners, too, I think. Name that tune. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Name that tune. There you go. Here I am thinking it's like a like a totally unique idea, and it's totally not. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. All right. Well, that takes us to our final trivia question, cast member costume. This playful costume features a short sleeve shirt with a horizontal color block design featuring bright yellow on the torso, red on the sleeve edge, and a pair of blues also involved. Maybe they are wearing a red cap, at least sometimes, and completing the outfit, dark blue, maybe black pants, because I'm not exactly sure, and some comfy black shoes. You both did not get us to the right attraction. It came up in your brainstorm again, (laughs) but you jumped away from Toy Story Midway Mania way too fast. Dang it! Really? (laughs) Dang it! (laughs) Toy Story Winmay Mania. It was the beret. That's what threw me. I thought Dang. I thought I was being helpful by describing it as a playful costume. Yeah. But uh didn't quite pick up on that one. Hmm. So two out of four, not bad. Pretty pretty good uh track record on your trivia. If you listeners at home want to help us out. Not only do we have our usual trivia at dlweekly.net email, but now if you go to the DL Weekly website, we have a form you can fill out and send those questions straight to producer Vern and I so you can hopefully hear them on a show and try to stump TNT with us. Well, we will be back next week with more Disneyland news and information. Until then, go out and enjoy the parks. And a special thank you to Sidel for editing the podcast. Please remain seated until the podcast comes to a complete stop and the doors have opened. Then collect your belongings, watch your head, and step carefully from the episode. On behalf of all of our crew, thanks for traveling with us. And we hope you have a happy and memorable visit here at DL Weekly.